Recently, I started building an office slash studio for myself because my mother-in-law has taken ill and she rooms with my daughter Mallory, who's almost 15 now, so they both need their separate space. And I have an office inside the house. We have a four-bedroom house, three bedrooms occupied by two people apiece, except for my room, which has three people because Jackson sleeps in the crib in the corner because I have so many children and relatives in the house. Four bedrooms runs out very quickly, especially when I'm using one for an office. So, I'm building an office so my mother-in-law can have her own room, Mallory can have her own room, teenage girl needs her space, 82-year-old girl needs her space. Everybody wins, I have an office, I can soundproof it, I can look out at the yard while I'm recording, everything is wonderful. Now, what is not as wonderful is that it costs a ton. Boards that cost $2 now cost $10. Boards that cost $10 cost $40. And OSB is $45. It's insane. And it takes a lot of OSB to sheath a house. So I needed all the help I could get. So I reached out to the people from Cooper and Hunter. A nice girl helped me. We're going to show the entire install of a Cooper and Hunter mini split to you guys. You're going to see what they're all about. It's 25 sear, which is really, really nice. It's going to be a heat pump. It's going to cool about 140 square foot. The smallest unit that they have is a 9,000 BTU, so that's what I got. It is an inverter, variable speed. So we're going to see a whole lot of different things in action. A lot of you probably have never used Cooper and Hunter before. I actually found them on Amazon. The pricing was so good. I looked up some pricing for some competitive models that you guys might have heard about, and they were all way higher and didn't come with near the amount of stuff that this Cooper and Hunter kit comes with. It comes with you know the heat pump. It comes with an air handler. It comes with line set, the wire, communication wire. It has a few knickknacks in it, and I believe some thumb gum as well. I haven't opened the package yet, but it feels like thumb gum is in this package. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about what it came with, and this will be the first of many videos which kind of shows the installation process. There might be a complete video, there might be segments, I don't know yet. But the stuff just got here and I want to say a big thanks to Cooper and Hunter for working with me on this. I think it's going to be awesome. I look forward to trying out the product and installing it and taking you guys along for the ride. So this is the Cooper and Hunter heat pump condenser. You can see it looks a lot like some of the mini splits that we know and love. And while I don't think it has a blue coil, which makes it different than most mini splits, the fan is a blue color. So all mini splits have to be blue, at least in one part, I guess. That's not true, I, I'm just joking, that's not true. So here's what I wanna ask you guys. You see this unit, you may not have used this brand before, you may recognize it looks similar to other brands. I don't necessarily recognize that, but you might if you've used a whole bunch of them. What do you want to know about this unit, personally? Do you wanna ask any questions? Do you want me to take any panels off? What do you want to know about this unit so you can compare it to what you know and love? Because I'm betting that a lot of you pro AC guys out there aren't as familiar with these as you are with Daikin, Samsung, LG. Those are more industry standard, whereas Cooper and Hunter is not. So whatever you want to know, I'll take a panel off. We'll look at a circuit board. I just want you guys to steer me in whatever direction you want. I can tell you one thing from lifting this thing up it definitely seems heavier than a normal 9000. I, I can lift it and move it, but it's definitely built like a tank. They're metal panels. I don't know if all mini splits have metal panels, but I've definitely put in some that were plastic by and large. These are metal, the grate's metal, the fan blade's plastic, the fan's pretty much standard, but a lot of the stuff is metal. The housing here is plastic where you have your flare nuts. And uh, here's the bag with flare nuts in it so you can install them or you can flare and forget these that's what we do we make a perfect flare with a navac flaring tool then forget these and leave them in this bag and then we are tempted to swear but we don't because we're god-fearing christian men and women so that's the outdoor unit let's take a look at the air handler real quick behind me i have the air handler and some of the kit which includes a line set and some of the electrical components so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to zoom in on each of these. We can talk about each one of them and kind of compare with what you might have already used in the field. As you guys can see, there's several different things this kit comes with. We have, you know what? I don't even know what this is yet. This might be a little uh, standoff brackets for the line set itself. Not sure, I'm going to 
research on this sleeve. Like I said, I just took all this stuff out. This is my initial view of the set. As we get into it, we're gonna be doing this whole read the instructions deal, which I always do, despite what people say in the comments. I always do that. We have the communication cable, which looks like it's probably 14 gauge, something like that. And to re-decide it, we have three wires, black, red, white, and a ground. Pretty standard fare. We have some tape, looks like to tape the line set with. And we have a little escutcheon plastic, escutcheon maybe to go through the wall. Not sure about this either, but that's what it looks like. And we have a lot of drain tubing. So enough drain tubing to go 16 feet. That's the line set that I have. And then of course we have the suction uh, suction gas line and saturated vapor lines. This is a mini split. We have both of those in 16 foot. They do come in longer, but I didn't need longer. And this is our, uh, like I said, drain tubing, corrugated drain tubing, which I may use this or I may just transition to hard PVC. I do like using hard PVC, but this is looks like a decent flexible material. Uh, it's pretty rigid. It doesn't crush when you pinch it. So it would be fine, I think, as well. Uh, I typically would use this sort of piping on a shorter line set. If it's gonna be longer, I like using something a little bit more rigid uh, like PVC. I think in the past, we've used half inch PVC for these mini splits and it's worked very, very well. One thing I had to go through here and, and wipe this thing down whenever I touch it, I was working outside, I get my dirty hand fingerprints all over it, which always makes me paranoid. Now this, this is plastic itself right here. You're gonna have an opening here where you're gonna have your air coming out the bottom. There's a nice big opening on top, which I'll turn it around in just a minute looks like like a little chromed out section here i'm not going to go into this too much it's just aesthetics right now i do like the size of the opening which i will kind of show you guys here i'm going to flip this around so the return opening is facing more in a upward fashion sometimes they don't face quite like this on many so it's just coming right off the top i like this i think this is a really nice wide open style to do with these um, you guys can make your comments on this. I'll be happy to look at this thing, answer any questions on this. Once I read up on it, we can open it up and look at it. Looks like some sort of air sensor right here, a thermistor. We have a filter here. And of course this comes with the thumb gum and standard fare like a mini split remote, wall mount for the remote. I do believe this is our drain for the bottom of the heat pump actually. And I'm going to tell you what, we have a couple pieces of something here, which I'm not sure it goes on the uh, filtration. I know that there's some electrostatic things out there that you can add to these. So not quite sure, but that's a look at the Cooper and Hunter mini split indoor unit. And like I said, if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments. Send me an email at hvacshoptalk at gmail.com. So make sure to send any questions in because I'm not installing these for a few weeks. So they're here. I can look into them, we can read about them. What do you wanna know about them? Maybe something in the instructions, maybe the procedure. Whatever you wanna know, let me know. I hope that you enjoyed the little tour here. I hope you're excited to see where this goes. I know I am uh, having an office of my own that's gonna be hopefully soundproofed and a little quieter. I don't want to worry about small children yelling in the background. Although I do love seeing them. Sometimes it's best for the recording to go without a screaming child or a door stopper being plucked the wall behind me. So, hope you guys enjoyed it. I love taking you for the tour. Look forward to more and hope you enjoy the show. Well, that was a lot of fun, right? Learn about mini splits. Cooper and Hunter, never heard of them until like a month ago. Hey, that, the thing, the 9,000 BTU, I remember putting in these like little, the, the smaller ones, like the sevens, eights, or nines, and it's like really easy to lift them and move them around. So either one of two things has happened. Either the Cooper and Hunter is heavier, as I stated in the video, or I've become weaker and older, which is also possible. Not quite sure which one that is. So welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, we have a bunch of great live commenters here. We have T. Leck, our buddy Thomas Old, Handy Luke, uh, who's asking me steam heat questions, which I evaded. And then my own guest says I need to learn steam heat down there, which is, you know, can't argue with that. <laughs> what reversing valve? Ask me a reversing valve question. I can get that. Probably. I should say probably. 
Uh, we have, I'm not even going to say your name. It's uh, expletive. But dang, son, what's up? And who else here? Greg Howe, Scott Jones. Welcome to the show. Glad you guys are here. I want to, oh, J.K. Kato. J.K. Kato, Raul Mesa. And Facebook user, a Facebook user, people who watch on Facebook, which is awesome. You can watch on YouTube, too. It's a little bit easier to see the comments. But if you're on Facebook, I can't see your name. So if you give me your name, it's a lot easier. Justin P., what's up? HKHVAC Dragon. Awesome. Uh, J. Kato sent me some pictures of the prize he won. And I want to say it was the last time, I know Eric's down there, he can hear me. But last time he was here, I think we were giving away the field piece pump. I'm almost positive we were, and he's the one who won. He sent me some pictures, which I haven't downloaded yet, so you'll see those next week probably. And uh, James Patrick. What's up, James Patrick? So we have a, a heaping helping of knowledge. So that's a good way to say it. It's a nice Southern Buffet term. I was at a Southern Buffet the other day. So heaping helping of knowledge is on the way. I just want to run over a few things here. I'll skip all my stories I was going to tell. Uh, I'll skip Landon's Xbox controller, uh, the trash heap for now. We're going to come back to that one. It was horrible. The grass. I cut the grass today, but there's more to it, so we'll skip that. HBAC Shop Talk is a podcast as well. We're all over social media, even the hellish landscape, which is TikTok, which is really popular. If uh, I don't know. I think it's a communist something, other is what they say, but you know, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is it's an awful place a lot of the time. Try to avoid it except for, you know, HVAC shop talk. <laughs> or just don't go. Just watch us on Instagram. It's the same content. But I hate to say that, but that's that's the truth. But if you're on TikTok, go ahead and look us up. That's fine. I, I do have one other small, tiny, 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 tiny clip, because that one was big at the beginning. And then we're going to talk to Eric. We're going to be talking about charging, too. And we're going to take it in different direction tonight. So... James Patrick says he lives right down the road in Leland. Man, we go to Leland all the time. It's a small world. Let's have lunch. Same Southern Buffet. I'm serious, too, by the way. I have a short little clip for you guys, and uh, this is special because we had to pay homage to our wonderful sponsor, NAVAC, but I thought, how can we how can we do that? Because, you know, when shows have sponsors, it's like, I don't want to say we're brought to you by Campbell's Soup or something like that, which would be awesome. I love their soup. It's great. But I want to do something creative. So I decided to do something creative this week. It only lasts about a minute long, and then we're going to talk to Eric. So this is what I call, it's a miniature tiny baby sponsorship movie called The Flare. HVAC Shop Talk presents The Flare. Time to make the perfect flare. This Novak contraption should do very well. I do believe one of these small clamp thingies will do very well, and uh, if I want to see it up close, it looks something like this here right now, therefore. A little bit of the man's strength to close this off. Let's release this mechanical beast from the copper pipe to see if it's made a nice cone-shaped thingy. Ah, I have now made the perfect flare. What could ever be more beautiful? No. No, 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 no. <gasps> no! That's right. I'm an idiot. That's correct. Uh, this is what I do with my time. That's right. You can judge me. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Welcome to the show, Eric Kaiser. Man, you're killing me here. Did you, did you enjoy that? Because it's like uh, it's relatable comedy. I think, well, pretty much all. Of, if, it, if you haven't forgotten to put a flare nut on, you haven't been in HVAC very long. It's, it's kind of like forgetting to take the pressure out of a system 
and turn it on your vacuum pump. Everybody pretty much does it at least once. Oh, yeah, that is that's true. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's a rite of passage mistake. It I think it is. At once, one point or another. Some but point, I, everybody does it. I'm going to ask you something. Is the YouTube still on your computer? It is. I can hear it. Really? I, I can hear it somehow, some way, because it's like eight seconds behind. It's really weird. Okay. I'll just mute it. Make sure it's muted over there. But I don't know. I don't. I don't know either. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't know if this is right or not. But the internet, whenever you have something on the internet, it can transmit sounds across things without really? them being connected with wires. I had no idea. Hey, you That's know, this, cool. it's science time here. This is the same person that just made that movie you watched. Oh. Uh, Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You. It's like a third grader did something uh, for this show. <laughs> I feel like I'm sitting next to a celebrity all of a sudden. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think you're mistaken. Uh, perhaps you're talking about anti DIY HVAC that's in the chat. He's got over 35,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure that's close. He's, he's really good. He's really good. Nice. So that's your celebrity right there. And it's definitely not me. But hey, since we're already here, um, we might as well have a talk about charging segue. Well done. Like, like a bowl charging, like, are we oh, talking, uh, or maybe how much to charge or, or that would or, be good too. Bison, bison charging. That's scary. Oh, a lot of those things are interesting though. Uh, maybe not applicable to our audience, but like the charging part, we could talk about how much do you charge for a refrigerant? The most common question ever asked in mankind between techs, between customers and techs, company owners and techs. How much y'all charge for a refrigerant? You know what? That for the past, well, every summer, every spring and summer, that is like the most asked question on every Facebook group under the sun. Mm -hmm. How how much you guys charge for a refrigerant everywhere else? You know what, guys? It doesn't freaking matter. <gasps> wow. <laughs> wow, you're not going to be invited to the next barbecue. <laughs> Facebook HVAC barbecue. You are not going to be there, and we have a nope. lot of cool people. Probably not. It doesn't matter how much everybody else charges. Charge what you got to charge and keep on going. Yeah. You know, that's that, it's common. That's common. And the fact just a bottle of refrigerant, I've noticed it comes from like a wholesale and retail perspective. The question is like, how much you buy that refrigerant for? Then how much you sell it for? 410A or which one? Because, you know, there's a lot of a lot of refrigerants these guys use. You never see it. You never hear, how much is that R422D? That's not said enough, is it? Right, they don't. They don't ask that question. Who cares? They just go buy it because they they need it. And well, suddenly we got to fix somebody's stuff. Yeah, yeah. I like to think of I like to think of things that people don't buy to make them wonder if they should know what it is already. It's like, have you gotten uh, another quart of PVE oil yet? How much y'all charging? How much y'all paying for that contactor over there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How much the contactor? <laughs> Uh, they're saying it's it's the small it's a small talk it's a breaking the ice thing I guess so but the customers are breaking the ice too evidently. Um, I tell you what every every Facebook I'm, group I'm on for the past month wow what happened to the price of refrigerant guess what guys it went up. <laughs> that's the, that's the mystery <laughs> answer. It's higher. It's higher. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. It is higher. But yeah. but and we're it, not talking it about that. Almost every summer. You know, is it is it that cyclical that you can tell every summer that it's yeah. a little bit? But yeah. I, don't, I don't know how much it is this year. I, re I really don't. Last time I bought R22 or R410A was a few months ago, and it was reasonable. So something's happened in between then and now because everybody's talking about it. You should, you should jump on to um, what what is the name of that group? Oh, that's right, HVAC Shop Talk on Facebook and ask that question. The okay. HVAC should Shop I, Talk group. Should I do it now? I've heard I've heard that that's a pretty good group to ask those questions in. I see I see that we're live in that group right now actually. Sweet. And uh, I can finally see who the Facebook user is. Hey Mark, I can see it over here. I should probably just leave that open then. You need about right. three or four more monitors there to open up some more windows. Dude, I I literally, you know, part of my Landon's Xbox controller story, we're going to cut out everything else except for this particular statement. I have three. I have laptop uh monitor monitor i said well what if i want a fourth because i can go completely cross-eyed or something like that i said i need a mini display port cord that goes to hdmi or vga or whatever they didn't have it that's the only port left on this thing that could possibly go to a monitor so i need to put a monitor on it it'll crash 
Mm -hmm. It should crash. It should crash. See, the guys start talking when you talk about refrigerant. Now they're all like, hey, what's going on with refrigerant? And it's like the whole rest of the conversation is going to be like, man, I can't believe it. It costs $5 million a jug. It's crazy. It goes up. It goes down. Yeah, it's it's kind of like watching stock prices. I like your earthy interpretation of this. It's higher. That's what happened. <laughs> it goes up and down. Just buy it and sell it appropriately as it goes up and down. <laughs> Foolish me. I, I, I really try not to worry too much about things that I basically have no control over. Mm, so. This is true. This is true. Well, let's talk about something we can control, which is our charging techniques once we have the jug. We got to put, we have, yeah, well, we have to put it into the machine somehow, right? Not just a hose going to the low side and going. I just realized I, I should have brought in some stuff for show and tell tonight. What bring, do you have? I didn't bring show and tell stuff in. Gadgets, man. Like near you right now, because you can go get it if you want to. If it's that critical that you think it's going to be it's cool like on all, air, like all the way out in my shop, and I'm in the house, and you know, I'd have to put mm. pants on before I got up. Well. Well, okay. Yeah, some, one of us should wear pants anyway, at least one of us. Um, okay, well, we can talk. And then if you feel like the need that you have to go get this thing, I, I've been known to be able to talk on my own for hours at a time. Really? I can cover you. Much like going through a firefight, I will cover you while you go out there and grab it and come back. You're it a will good be fine. man, Zach Siona. You're a good man. I just put it on automatic. It's really little effort for me. <laughs> I, I don't even know what's being said. It was like a disconnect. I'll actually think about movies and stuff while my mind just spouts things that I've learned about in the past. So we should segue. I ripped my paper. I want servers. <laughs> Say what? I, w I really want a segue. They're fun. I don't think I can stay on top of one. I'm, I'm going to go around that, too, because that'll be another five-minute diversion right there. <laughs> so we're trying to divert, but it will end up being a diversion. Oh, you meant uh, the other segue. Sorry. I meant the uh, the media savvy segue. S e g u e, right? I see. Segue. You know, I'm gonna tell you this right now before we get started. My spelling, not to say I don't know what you're spelling, but it's horrible. I like to think I'm semi intelligent. Put the semi in there just to make it, you know, variable, so you can't really tell. But my spelling is horrible. I was I asked my wife. I said, uh, "How do you spell quesadilla?" And she goes, "Q u." And I said, "Okay, let me get rid of the c." It's like, and it seems so moronic. Like, I really thought it was C for like that moment in time, even though I've seen it like a million times. And it just seems like, a, well, it seems idiotic. It seems it, like. It's Cusadilla. That's how you spell it. <laughs> uh, well, Cusadilla, and I always say quesadillo. <laughs> Every single time, I'm like, I'm getting one of them chicken quesadillos. Yeah. My wife's real lucky. Uh, real lucky to have me. Dial a charge. Holy cow. Dial a charge. Well, we, we won't be covering a dial a charge on account that most of the techs that use it are dead. I think probably. I oh man, there's no way you used one in the field. Were you about to say that? I have actually used a dial a charge, not in HVAC. So way, way, way back when, when I was still, this was even before I was 18. I was uh, probably 16, 17 at the time. I worked for a small town home appliance repair and sales shop, and we used dial charges to charge up refrigerators and freezers, things like that. So yes, I have used a dial charge once. Intentionally, not just to make a like make the point of experimenting with one, but they actually like yep. on purpose. Mm -hmm. The purpose, <clears throat> well, and the, the purpose. It was back in the early nineties, so nineteen nineties. Wow. Okay. Well, I was working in 94, but I wasn't doing service, so I, I wasn't around to dial a charge. In fact, if you would have asked me like, up until like 15 years ago, I wouldn't even know what it was at all because uh, I've never used one. And I guess what the appeal, since we're talking about charging, this, you know, this applies. The appeal is you can charge small critical charges easily. Yeah, because it's all done by volume. Mm -hmm. So in the... In that cylinder, there's graduated marks on there. And rather than having to say, okay, we need X number of pounds, they say we need X number of, I, I, I want to say it was done in cubic inches, but they had a different scale, just like we have a scale on for a, a PT chart on the gauge, right? 
well, they just have a scale on there because each refrigerant takes up a certain volume at a certain temperature when it's in liquid phase. This seems very complicated, Eric. No, it's actually really simple. Then I'm an idiot. That's our two so options. Either this subject the, is complicated the, or I'm an idiot. Fill the liquid up to the line. Um, and you could make an adjustment on it for, I'm trying to, you realize this has been like 25 years since I've used, no, it's been longer than that. Early 90s, we're looking at 30 years now. <laughs> yeah, we're. We're touching on thir somewhere between 25 and 30 years since I've used one. What the crap? So it has been 30 years. A little okay. rusty at the moment. I guess you get a pass on that. 30 years seems like a... It basically, you filled it up to the line where you needed it. And re that was your volume of refrigerant that you needed to put in. And then you let that into the system. Okay. Well, that doesn't seem too bad. I mean, I've never used one before. I've seen people... People put them on the shelf now. It's like you have a dial -a charge behind you. As like a decoration. I've seen like streaming guys do it. I forget who does it. AK, think, AK had one on his, yeah. uh, behind him with uh, Christmas lights in it. I thought that was cool. I, I, I thought, man, that's a, that's a cool office light right there. That, that is cool. Actually. I like AK. He's cool. He, he just is. got promoted by the way. I don't know if you knew that. They send out like these press releases. Navac does. And I guess because I was a media, uh, a media pass at AHR, they oh, yeah. send them to me too. And, right. you know, he just got promoted to, I forget what it is, but he's moving up in the world. And he was already pretty high up there. So good for AK. He's awesome. Yeah. And good for Navac for promoting him because, you know, he's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He is. He's, and he's, and he's really, he, he, you know, I, 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 he used to be like the co-host of this show for a few months before he got that job because he co-hosted really? with me. Yeah. Because he had started like, it was just a few months because he got the job and he moved on because obviously that's a good choice right there. Yeah. And uh, he was he was you know all nerve wracked about it because he's a he's like a nervous guy, he he he's I don't know what's the right anxious we we'll call it anxious is better, but once he got the job it's like he just spread his wings and flew from there it was great yeah. it was really nice to see, but I know we had a question I don't know if this is applicable but it, you know what close enough I want people to ask questions that are in the chat so if you have a question charging related is best but uh, if you have a question put it out there it's uh. I'll put it on the screen here. What do you guys think about field piece leak detectors? I've only used the older ones. They have newer ones. So I think that's probably the newer ones he's asking for. And I, I don't know. haven't used them yet. I got, I have to agree. Um, I am a, I did some testing um, several years back uh, with a couple of different back rack leak detectors and probably everybody's heard of the H10. Well, the H10, is it the H10 Pro is their current version? I think that's their mm -hmm. current version. Yeah. Anyway, um, I got the opportunity to take a coil that had microchannel leaks in it. Or um, not microchannel leaks. <laughs> the the microchannel coil. Micro, uh, what is it? The ant nest corrosion. Uh, the um, Formicary? Formicary corrosion. There you go. So it was a, it was a coil that was proven to have formicary corrosion in it. Um, we took it, we dunked it in a tank of water and we marked every location that that coil was leaking by, you know, just bending the fins over or wherever, wherever the, the bubbles were coming up out of the coil in the water. Right. And we pulled it out because of course we had fittings on it already. It was pressurized up with nitrogen and we, um, I, I want to say we dumped about a hundred PSI of 410 in it. And we took a couple different leak detectors. And specifically, we took two back rack leak detectors. We took the H10 Pro and we took the, um, what's their really big one? The, the IR, oh, the PGM PG, IR. I, yeah, there you go. The, the PGM IR, the crazy expensive one that, that yeah. does PPM and all that stuff. And the PGM IR would pinpoint leaks once in a while but actually that h10 pro was more sensitive um to picking up and it picked up every leak on that coil what the world I, I, i've always loved the h10 i carried that so, after i first got one after that it was just h10 after yeah. that and it's what's funny is you mentioned like the test you just talked about 
I did like a YouTube version of this a few years ago where I pitted leak detectors against each other to find mm -hmm. a, it's a, it was 410A, I believe. Or maybe I did 22 and 410A. But I would take a group of like two or three and change the amount of refrigerant, well, it was refrigerant with some nitrogen behind it. It would like be 150 PSI, 100 PSI, 50 PSI. And of course, the H10 won that. Uh, but it, it took like a whole bunch of different ones. But I knew the H10 was going to win. But uh, I've always had a G personally, like the one with the plug. Yeah, that's not making that one, I guess. Is the G, and now they've got well, the Pro is the same, essentially the same thing as the G. It just has a little bit different sensor in it. They keep up. My understanding is they upgrade the sensor and they upgrade the electronics in it, basically with each iteration. I think it still has the plug. I don't think it has the plug anymore. I think the plug is gone. Although uh, maybe it does have like a little AC adapter and plug. Like yeah, the same when it charges. It's the AC adapter and plug to, to be able to charge it. Yeah, it charges. I don't, I don't know if you use it while it's charged. I guess you can. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. I, All right. yeah. I always have. It's been yeah, a couple okay. of years since I've pulled it out and used it. But to me, that H10 has always been my go-to detector. And I know there's a lot of newer ones out there. I haven't got a chance to test any of the newer um ones I, there's one other one that does read parts per million now the is it the prowler no not the prowler oh no it's it's the stratus from stratus the, there you uh, go inficon inficon yeah Inficon. Yeah. um i haven't had a chance to test that one and i actually have some reference leaks right so um a number of years ago i found out about a company over in the uk that makes reference leaks so what a reference leak is is it screws on to a tank of or a jug of refrigerant and at whatever pressure um it's rated at i think it's at 20 well i think it'd be 70 degrees fahrenheit this reference leak will leak three ounces per year like plus or minus 20 percent but when we're talking about three ounces per year plus or minus 20 percent variable is still pretty small right that's pretty cool. That's, that's so like what, real science right there. Well, I mean, but that gives you, because I used to see a lot of people, they would grab a jug of refrigerant, crack the bottle, stick their sniffer in the huge cloud that they just let out and go, yep, it works. Well, that's great if you're trying to track down this ginormous leak and like, walk you walk, so you walk in the do front door of some place and go, yeah, man, your place is full of refrigerant. What good does that do me if I'm trying to track down a, you know, pound per year leak? So this company makes these little things and they're, they're crazy expensive for what they are. Um, but I ordered up a, a, an R22 and an R410A version because, of course, that was the two refrigerants at the time that I was primarily dealing with. But it's neat to be able to take those and put the different leak detectors in front of them and really say, okay, this is actually picking up a very small and a measured small amount of refrigerant. I'm trying to find them while you're talking. So I see um, millions of dollars, but I don't think they're going to list them on Google shopping. It cost me uh, no, no, you have to order them directly from the manufacturer. And I, I want to say the name of the company is HT products. I'll look up that later. And at the time, I think, I want to say it was close to $500 for those two reference leaks for me. Yowzer. Man, but that's really, really precise. Right. That's what I can it understand. Proved to me, it saved me a lot of money in the long run because I was able to prove out leak detectors and say, okay, my leak detector's working, my leak detector's not. I'm yeah. not... At that point, I am no longer guessing if that leak detector is working and is working on the gas that I'm going to go after. I'm not laughing at what you're saying. I just I happen to look down and and Joe Zach has a reference <laughs> leak too. It's a Goodman coil. It's uh I did use a coil for this testing, uh, and I did uh, like a similar procedure. I, I tried to find a coil with a very small leak, and I knew because I have a lot of coils out there that a lot of them were leakers is why they're out there. So I put them into the, uh, the uh, a tote with water in it to see what frequency the bubbles and how many, because I found that a lot of them leaked all over the place. It was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. There was one that was really, really, really slow. So that ended up being the winner. It's funny that he remembers that. That's that's where you see that um, um, 
the uh that when you have them all over the place you have multiple streams of bubbles and especially when they're in the fin pack that's where you've got formicary corrosion and that's that's what I saw. It was interesting doing this because before that I had not really, you know, I've heard about stuff that this is formicary corrosion. And they show a picture of a pipe. It looked like it was kind of corroded all over. It's like okay, well, all right. But when I put those things into the water, and I could see like three or four spots where the bubbles were coming out. I was like, oh, this makes sense now. So it's it's like a good teaching tool, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. But uh, open my eyes, and I I never knew how many of the capillary tubes leaked on these coils till I put them in there because all over the place it'd be like three or four and it was a good men thing where they'd rub together a lot of the times because I saw it more than once and uh, it was just one of the other things I see I've seen on coils with cap tubes leaking is if they are laying up against the insulation uh, or if they're laying up against um, a piece of steel or something like that those cap tubes will generate holes in them because uh, it holds the moisture up there and then you get a uh, like a dissimilar metals corrosion you know, and I've seen some of these where it, it almost has a, a discoloration to it in these areas. Mm-hmm. And they, they would all be leaking, and just, you could even look at them. It almost like whenever I installed, I installed a couple of units at the beach, and they were Goodman too, because the guy worked with a guy that worked for a distributor that distributed Goodman products. And it was, it was right on the water. I mean, it was right there. And I, and I just, it was humorous to me. Says, I would love to install these things for you. Are you sure this is what you want to install? It's like, yeah, these are Goodman products. We sell those. I understand. That's the ocean, and uh, and so <laughs> they okay. hold up. They, you know, they hold up just as well as everything else does in front of the ocean. Well, this this was perfect because on the same beach, same orientation, same street, uh, I installed a coastal Ohio unit, like two miles away. So it was a really good reference. Now, the Coast Ohio unit wasn't exactly faring super after like three or four years, but it was all still together. And the Goodman unit was already beginning, like the fins were beginning to fall off of it and stuff. And the outer fins, the grate was starting to fall apart. So I'm pretty sure that thing's dust now. That was three or four years ago. So might not have, there probably been two units changed out there since then. It's always funny to go down to the beach. The unit before that was just the coil, the copper, and there was no fins at all. And it was running. It was like, I wonder what head pressure is on this unit. Just curious. I never checked that. I should have checked that. Tink, tink, oh. tink, tink. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and speaking of charging, uh, we have a charging-related question here. And this is nice. We can take a few questions and people so, learn very targeted, specific. You mean we're going to actually touch on the topic that we're supposed to be talking about instead of everything else? <laughs> Maybe so. About. It would be great to have charging questions specifically, but you know that request doesn't always go through. Plus, people have things they're thinking about. They said, hey, there's guys. Let me ask them. Yeah. Um, here it is. It's uh, buddy Steve <clears throat> says, can we cover CTOA? It's not a good idea to cover your condenser um, unless it's turned off. That's true. One of them up north little plastic covers, so they leave on and call the service company and so say, you left the cover on. Or the roofing company throws a tarp over it. Yeah. Or a tarp or a bunch of shingles or something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, I mean, okay, this is a big subject, though, right? I mean, you're oh. talking about. Putting your hand yeah. above there and going, that's about 10 degrees. That's a really high efficiency. Sure. You have two hands for that, one on the side and one on the top. Right. Delta, right. What about when it shoots out the side of the fan instead of straight up out of the fan? I swear that's OEM. That's what I say. That's an OEM fan, but they look down and it says like Century on it. That's like, I thought it was an OEM. It's like the, the actual housing of it. And, and I feel like we should elaborate because there's new people here too. Like, you, you'll come to a unit and you'll change the fan motor. This is what I'm talking about. And the fan motor will be deeper. Like, the replacement motor will be deeper. And you'll have, like, a few type units. I found Carrier was like this. that were real sensitive if you moved them. And you'd have air shooting out the side, and your head pressure would be up, like, 40 or 50% higher than it was before. It's not good. It's not good. Yeah, There's uh, very few units. There's a couple of the old, what the little, they were the little cube carrier units that would shoot air out the sides when they were brand new. But most condensers, if you, you walk up to it, and if that air is shooting off the side of the fan, coming off the end of the blades, you know you got a dirty coil. And even oh, if it yeah. looks clean, split that coil and clean it, because it's probably plugged up in between the coil. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's true, because you have a lot of coils that are doubled up. I always think residential, and there's some on resi- residential, but also commercial. You have the coils doubled up yeah. with all the hair in between them. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean... I've seen- depends on your age and what what company for residential a lot of the companies now are trying to make things single row but man i cut my teeth on lennox and 
let me tell you what, there's a ton of old Linux stuff out there with double row coils and carriers got double row coils on when they have mm -hmm. the, the fin, tube and fin coils. My good buddies at Goodman used to use them quite a bit, especially on their high efficiency tanks they built. Yeah. Wonder why they're so heavy. There's a couple coils yeah. in there. And uh, yeah, they get dirty fast. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a quick, for me, that was a quick check during maintenance. Hey, how how dirty is this coil? Am I going to have to split it or not? Or or if I'm just walking past yeah. it or whatever, it's like, hey, how, you know, give me an idea how dirty this is so I can get a a handle on what I have to do. Well, it's horizontal discharge, so it's dirty. Hmm. It's horizontal now, <laughs> uh, so it must be dirty. Uh <laughs> Unless it's supposed to be horizontal. Then it's all right. Yeah, then it's supposed to be. And I, and I realized when you're when you're talking about that, the cube carrier units, <clears> I, I now remember like carrier and then there was like uh, BDP was a lot of the units that I used to work on, the older ones, and they had the side discharge coming yeah, off. Yeah, it, it was that little teeny tiny square one with like the, uh, it almost had like a an angled top on it, right? So the that taller motor would fit in above the compressor, mm -hmm. the taller condenser fan. Those Good were the times. worst from the factory for kicking air off the side. <laughs> that reminds me of cutting shafts off of stuff. Well, this <laughs> is hitting the compressor, so I have to cut the shaft off of this. <laughs> uh, that was good times. So, um, I hope that worked out okay for that customer. I was unsure about that, but it seemed to work. And I was young and stupid. Or it was the other day. Whatever. I'm not going to talk anymore yeah. about it. Anyway, so, CTOA. Absolutely. CTOA. CTO, what is, well, so what is CTOA? Let's start there. Are you asking me what it is? Well, sure. Are you going to, we should do like, like a rhetorical question to me, but not rhetorical to the chat sort of situation. I mean, we can ask the chat too, see if they know what it is. How many Because what if I don't know it and I don't want to look stupid? Then the chat can answer. Oh, okay. Then I'll tell you what CTOA is. That's all right. Certified technician on assignment. Ooh, um, that's a good that's, one. I like That's that. awful clever for someone who doesn't know a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so uh, CTOA. I, I know what it is. Okay, okay cool. Condensing temperature over ambient. Oh, yeah. Over yeah. ambient. Air goes in one temperature, comes out another temperature. Right, but... All right. Condensing temperature over ambient. Condensing temperature over ambient. So the temperature... All right, let me, let me interact here. Uh, so the temperature, your condensing temperature of your liquid refrigerant or your refrigerant in the oh, condenser. Your refrigerant, period. Your... Your yeah, of your refrigerator, right? Your saturation temperature. Yeah, delta T over outside right. air. So you got to have, you know, if if your your outside air is here, right? We have to have that um, condensing temperature has to be higher than outdoor ambient. So when we pass air through that coil, because heat goes from high to low, if that refrigerant in that condensing coil is higher at temperature wise, then the air entering that coil, it's going to transfer heat into it. Makes sense. Now, so condensing temperature over ambient plays a big role in things because that's kind of what sets our head pressure, right? Because right. pressure is a result of temperature. Right. Remember this pressure is a result of temperature when everything is working properly. Not dirty. Well, not dirty. But, I mean, it's still a result of, of temperature because the, the air and the volume. It's, it's a result of temperature and volume of air, if you really want to get down to it. That so makes sense. You know, there's there's certain CFM. Volume. Yeah. There's a design volume at a specific temperature that sets our, our condensing temperature. So we need to have a certain amount. And typically on most units, um, it's around 20 degrees. Some of the older units would run around 25 degrees, the old uh, lower um, efficiency units. And that plays a part into compression ratio. So compression ratio is set um, off of the absolute pressures, not gauge pressure. So you have to add absolute in there to, to, to figure out what your compression ratio is. But as we move your high pressure and low pressure closer and closer together, we lower our compression ratio, which means we use less energy. Compression ratio is directly rated to wattage used. From the compressor. Yeah. 
by the okay. compressor. That makes sense. Low, I didn't think about the uh, the the part where we're using absolute pressure. Mm -hmm. That did not occur to me before. So you that's have a good tip. to use absolute pressure to calculate compression ratio. So if if I'm in Denver, should I be using like thirteen? You have to use absolute. Something? <laughs> I have to look it up or something. Well, 14.7 at sea level, correct? And then it changes and goes lower as you go higher? Correct. You're, well, your your atmospheric pressure goes lower. Absolute pressure stays right. the same. The, the delta between the two goes lower then. Your delta between absolute zero and your absolute zero here, right? And then mm -hmm. your atmospheric pressure actually goes down as you get higher because you have less air on top of you pushing down. That makes sense. Like being at the bottom of the ocean. It's a lot of Except pressure. The other way. Well, kind of, yeah. yeah. No, being at the bottom of the ocean, right? More water crushed on you. Yeah. Yeah. 14.7 won't crush you, but the bottom of the ocean will. So it's not exactly the same. Of course, well, you can't breathe. If you, uh, you look in the ocean, the atmosphere doubles every 33 feet. I love watching the videos about that. I've watched tons of videos about, and the pressure down here where James Cameron was, was like, in the window cracked, it was six inches thick of glass. I just think it's fascinating. Well, it's that's crazy. totally off the subject, but. Crazy. <laughs> it's interesting. It, it's science. So. It is. Take a balloon down with you sometime when you scuba dive. Watch it get smaller as you go down. <laughs> I like that, when I scuba dive, like that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> when I snorkel, I'll take the balloon with me and see what happens. Take a balloon. Yeah, pull a balloon down with your tie a, tie a balloon to a lead weight and watch what happens. Man, now I want to know what happens. I'll YouTube it, see what happens. I don't need to find a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Always with the science experiments. Uh, now I got to go to the ocean. Um, okay, so it's the we're using absolute pressure and, to and not the gauge pressure to calculate your um, um, compression compression ratio. Yeah. Okay. All right. Didn't mean to divert you. Go ahead. Yeah. But so your condensing temperature over ambient is how much um, your head pressure is or, or your how much your saturation temperature is over the entering air temperature of the condenser coil. OK, so we're looking at our gauges. We're looking for saturation then we're comparing it to what we have out there now. OK, so all right, from service tech perspective, I have an old unit. You say 25 or so. I checked the thing and said, hey, it's 40. What am I supposed to be thinking there? I, I would be looking at airflow first. So blocked coil. Yeah, blocked coil. So Wrong fan, maybe. Wrong fan motor. Yeah, I mean, wrong fan blade. Who knows? Wrong adjustment. So if you adjust that fan up and down on that shaft, you have to get that fan pretty well centered, excuse me, in the volute, right, which is the round thing around that fan. And there's a certain spacing around there that allows the that allows the fan to create that suction and doesn't allow the fan to just recirculate. Because if you don't have a volute around the fan, it, it'll recirculate off the ends. Too much area around the fan. Yeah. Okay. If if you put in a, you know, because you got a volute here and you put a fan blade in that's say. Say you have a 20 inch volute and you put in a, a an 18 inch fan blade. And it's designed for an 18 inch fan blade. You're going to have an inch of space all the way around. Well, you go to the supply house to get a fan blade and they only have a 16 inch fan blade. You're going to have way more space. You're going to have an extra inch of clearance on each side. That fan blade's not going to move the same amount of air because the blades are smaller. And it also has, um, it allows recirculation around the edges of that. Um, somebody said wrong pitch fan blade as well. So mm -hmm. there's a number of things that can happen that would cause that. Now, wrong now, wrong pitch made me think, I have a question for you real quick. Uh, wrong pitch made me think that when I had a fan blade that was totally trashed and I go to Johnstone and I buy it because they have just aftermarket fan blades with the hub you put on them and stuff like that. Is, is that going to be a mistake necessarily? Because how you're not going to confirm how many CFM are going through your condenser. I, I don't see anybody doing that. Well, there's you, not a way to do it. I don't know. You want to do yeah, – there, there are ways to do anything. I mean, obviously, they measure the CFM at the factory. Sure. Um, the easiest way to do that would actually be to make a powered flow hood out of like a duck – or a, not a duck blaster, but a, a blower door fan. 
yeah, and you can easily measure the the volume through there. And you would have to have something. Okay, so we're talking about putting a powered flow hood on top of a condenser. Mm -hmm. And do you think, because we talked about flow hoods before, and maybe not me and you, but I know perhaps me and you, but we talked to guys like Bill Spohn and Steve probably, Rogers. Probably Jenry. Jenry. Jenry as well. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. yeah. In fact, a whole host of guys are really smart on this. So when you're putting the flow hood on something like a condenser, you're going to have a lot of uh, static pressure built up underneath it, I would think. Do you think it'd be accurate? That's why you make a a powered flow hood. Okay. And it so, will compensate for that much? So the powered flow hood is essentially a pressure compensating fan. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're actually putting a second fan on. You've got your regular fan down here for your condenser, and you put a second fan up here that also measures airflow through it. Now, this second fan has two. You hook a gauge up to that, like a you know, it's a controller for that fan, and you measure the pressure between the two fans, and then you measure the pressure in the atmosphere, and and that second fan pressure matches so that there is zero extra resistance on the unit fan. Okay, and I, I don't understand the premise of it. For some reason in my mind, I was uh, thinking that it wouldn't be capable of handling that volume, but I guess the volume, as I recall, when I actually looked at the, like, the data sheets on these, it'd be like 2,000 CFM out of some of these things. So in the same, that area, give or take, whatever. So it does handle that, because it does that on the supply side, right? Well, if, it depends on if you're talking about a duct blaster or a, a blower door fan. And that's why I would use a blower door fan for um, like measuring a condenser because they will do at 50 pascals. Mine will do, I think, 6,000 CFM. Holy crap, yeah. At 50 pascals of difference. If I'm, I think that's the spec on it, somewhere around there. But, you know, that's pretty much a standard blower door. So, yeah, if you wanted to measure, actually measure that volume, you could do it. It's it's fairly easy to do in the field. Man, I like that. I, I, I kind of want to do it now. <laughs> you know, I got a unit outside. I kind of want to do it. Now you I need, need to borrow blower. a hood. Now you need a blower door. <laughs> yeah, I need a blower. I need one of those anyway. I like to do that in my house. It'd be you great. need a blower door and some uh, cardboard and some tape. I, you know, I bet if I uh, ask nicely and bat my eyes or something, one of these fine people I know would send me a blower door. I have a couple people in mind. I, I think there's one that's not too far from you. I think there's one that's not too far from Hey, there's a contractor friend of mine, fellow YouTuber, if we're talking about the same guy, that I think he has one. Mm-hmm. Fellow YouTuber, con contractor, or uh, um, does a um, Facebook group and all that stuff? That is correct. I don't know why we're being secretive. It's Steven. Least, yeah, I think he's got <laughs> at least one, probably like two or three if I know him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I know he has at least the one because that's like I, I, I speak to him periodically, and yeah, I ought to get him to come down here. He wanted to come down here anyway. He was going to podcast live, like from my house. So yeah, that's great. Why not, man? Have some hot dogs. You know, that's that's every guest I have has the opportunity they can come here live if they want to. But Stephen, that's actually feasible. So I mean, hey, it might actually happen. Go. Hey, we yeah. had it a couple times. We did that'd it a couple a cool, times. That'd be a cool time to. Um, try that i've never i've never actually tried it on a condenser but i know it can be done yeah because that's the, the question that's what weavers ask is anyone used uh, has anyone in the chat used a flow hood to measure condenser airflow it never even occurred to me to you do wouldn't, that. i just thought I wouldn't it was a mystery a flow hood because most flow hoods are going to add a ton of resistance to that that's going to actually reduce the volume of airflow going through there and and raise your head pressure artificially and it's not going to get a real accurate measurement um Steve Rogers and the Energy Conservatory actually did a study on flow hoods about how much pressure they add and how accurate they are um, once they start adding too much pressure to them. And the accuracy goes down typically the higher volume. There's kind of a sweet spot in them. Hmm. And if you start adding too much flow through them, the accuracy actually goes down. And that's where you want to get a pressure matched flow hood or a powered flow hood in Really, all it is is a pressure matching fan. I think I watched that actually the the training he did because I talked about it with him when he was on the show a few months ago, 
Mm-hmm. And it was really awesome because they had like one or two powered flow hoods in this array of hoods. I think there was like six of them. And the power power flow hoods ruled the day. They were the yeah. most oh, accurate yeah. because they, they would. They would sense the pressure or insertion loss, I think was the word. Yeah. And they would compensate for it, which made it really accurate. And the other ones were – some of them were kind of wild. They were like way far off. So it was kind of scary. Yeah, I mean you – in the world of flow hoods, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had the cheapest one of the whole bunch. But you know, which was accurate like at the low CFMs, it was it was pretty good. But when you got up high, it's like not as much. So it depends on what you're measuring, I guess. It it really all depends um what you're trying to do. Because it can be it, even though it's not absolutely or accurate from an absolute standpoint, it gives you a comparator. Yeah. That, well, that's true. That's true. Because a lot of times all we need is a comparator. We need to compare one thing to another. Oh, and yeah, if they have mind. similar volumes coming out of them, or they are supposed to have similar volumes coming out of them, mm-hmm. the absolute number doesn't matter. You measure the volume coming out of both of them. And if it's the same, then they have an equal volume coming out. What that's it is true. at that point, maybe it does or doesn't matter. So you have to understand what it is you're trying to do, what it is you're trying to measure, and is that absolute number really necessary for what you're doing? Well, I think that that raises a good point because uh, as service techs, the absolute number becomes less critical in general, and thinking on your feet and that comparative stuff becomes more critical. You're wincing. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Okay, well, let's take what we're talking about. All right, the question was about uh, condensing temperature over ambient mm-hmm. so our, our service tech is going to be going all right let's figure out the condensing temperature over ambient because i think a lot of us out there probably use measure quick and a lot of that's kind of baked in and that's i think a lot of them use it at install let me ask this question because i don't know if, if you know you ever run a call with measure quick before but if you're running a standard service call are you breaking out measure quick or high high tech software or are you throwing on some analog gauges i mean the mentality is different across that service tech and install i would think everybody's commissioning at a higher level with some of the higher level tools but service tech sometimes it's she's 72 psi let's go i'm gonna be honest i i haven't really now you gotta realize i've been out of the field for a little while so i haven't super jumped on the bandwagon of of measure quick or uh really his predecessor i manifold um Mm -hmm. i do own an I manifold, right? I mean, but I I've used digital gauges for years, and because I learned a lot of the math and the understanding of all this prior to the software packages coming out, most of that I actually do in my head that I get it close enough. You know, I'm not going to be right on the the nets behind every time. But I'm going to run some quick math in my head or, or pull out a calculator and, and start making a bunch of notes. And I've got some key things that I check and I look at as benchmarks. You know, I totally understand what you're saying. I bet you don't pull out a calculator very often. I bet you just said that to make us feel better. What do you mean? I carry one with me every day. <laughs> well, I got a phone, if that's what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, when I hear what you're saying, okay, I don't use Measure Quick either. Do you want this one? Either? Do you want that calculator too? I, mean, I got, I got, I got, well, I got one like that somewhere. Where's my TI 87? I'll, I'll do it. I'll graph a parabola or oh, something. Geez. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'll, I'll go into that story in a second. You'll, uh, you'll I mean, I've that. got a graphing calculator on my, um, on my phone, but you know what? Ninety nine percent of what we need to do right here for charging is simple math, simple addition and subtraction. Okay. Well, this, I want to talk about this. This is good. This is really good. Uh, I just, I, I want to break in because I want to tell you that I don't use Measure Quick. I still do calls from time to time. I don't use Measure Quick, and it's probably it's very similar to what you're saying. I have I have the little digital uh, P51 gauges, and I have analog stubs that I put on stuff too. So if I have like let's say let's say I'm a good boy and I put on digital gauges for the accuracy, and I'm reveling in the fact that I'm doing a great HVAC job with those, and and I what I do is I look at that. I'll look at like how efficient the unit is in general because you can recognize them usually after you've been around for a while. 
and I'll compare the saturation temperatures with the temperatures outside and inside, and I know what the delta is supposed to be, the, like the, the evaporator saturation temperature and whatever return air we're coming in, and end up doing the stuff that it would do for you just on the fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just picking whatever, like cherry picking what you need and maybe omitting, you know, I don't have my delta static yet because I don't think I need it because our saturation, the delta between the evaporator and return air looks normal. So it looks like the airflow is within, you know, a relatively good area. Is that what you're saying when you say that? Something like that, yeah. So, I mean, I typically, if I'm going to go in and charge a system, if I, as a service tech, if I'm going to jump on a system, um, the first thing I am going to look at is airflow. That's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. How, how are you going to check airflow on a system? Because you know these beaters out here. All right, let's take it. you got a beater. It's a 1999 Good Mana Troll. That's what I call them. Good Mana Troll. And it's it's got a bad run cap. Are you checking airflow there? I made it really simple, so it would be a, like an so, extreme example. I'm going to check airflow with a little bit different technique than actually measuring the volume, right? Because measuring the okay. volume, because the volume of air we care about is what passes over the evaporator or the indoor coil. Mm-hmm. And we have to have proper airflow going over the outdoor coil as well. Um, so, yeah, if it's got a run cap, I need to get it running first. To see mm-hmm. what else is wrong, and that's sure. that's a whole other process right there, talking to the customer and, and all that good stuff. But <clears throat> I'm going to look visually at the condition of the filters. I may or may not take static pressure, depending. But most of the time, I'm going to go get the system running, and then I'm going to take my delta enthalpy across the indoor coil. Like we're brothers from another mother. It's the first right. thing I look at. Yeah. Right. Get it up and running 15 minutes in, 20 minutes in, um, after it starts, after the compressor starts up. I want to know what my delta enthalpy is. Okay. So you, you, you put your probes that can read enthalpy or if you want to figure it out on your own and you have a couple of measurements, you figure it out on your own and you're 6.6. Great okay, day. I'm done. Air, my airflow is pretty doggone close, and my charge is likely likely real close at that point. So that's a that's a pretty quick and easy. Okay, uh, the six point six factors into the capacity formula to make it like a nice four hundred cfm standard formula. So okay, well, why don't you tell everybody what the formula is because we all might be speaking Greek to someone who's newer. Why, why that makes sense, basically. You want me to go through all? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. Uh, just like, the formula it's itself. I don't know. That would be tough because if they're new. Um, yeah, and I don't okay. have a whiteboard. I'm, I I don't have a whiteboard behind me here, right? Not not one that I can get on because it's full of other stuff at the moment. Oh man, I wish I, I wish I, I wish I would have brought up the whiteboard app I have over here. I wouldn't have been any help though. But, okay, let's we'll keep it basic. We'll come back to that in a different show. Uh, so capacity if, formula. If you have, um proper airflow across a system your delta enthalpy which you can get from um uh, basically you need to know the wet bulb temperature is what it boils down to there's conversion charts if you know relative humidity and dry bulb you can get it from those two there's a ton of conversion apps for smartphones uh, that that start switching around the properties of air and you can look at a process like um, I think it's Munters has a really nice one where you can enter two points. You can enter a, uh, entering and leaving and you end up it shows you what that process is doing. Uh, if you know the airflow, it'll even show you um, what the uh, um, how many BTUs it's removing, et cetera, et cetera. If you know it's a solid airflow volume. So it'll do all kinds of neat stuff real quick. And it's free. So you can go download it, put it on your smartphone. I think I used that at one point. It was, yeah. uh, cause, but, well, I got into, around the time of the Am- I Manifold, I got intrigued by trying to figure out what it was, all the stuff that it was telling me. So I kind of backtracked. I had all these little psychometric charts. Cause I would print them out and I would plot it out and draw the lines and stuff like that. And I really started to understand it a lot better from doing that. 
And I remember I was talking to Bergman on the phone. Bergman said, here, try this chart right here. You'll like this chart. And I opened up the chart, and I, and I got a feel for drawing the line mm -hmm. to the enthalpy curve and figuring it out. It, it was really eye-opening. I don't know if that's going to be beneficial. Do people still do that, do you think, learn about the actual chart itself? Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people still learn about it. It's it's very beneficial if you're doing certain things. Uh, I don't find myself jumping to it first thing. Um, so I, I, I go for um, some other things first. So I see we have a question here, right? I do see that. enthalpy is five. Where do you go from there? Great question. If my delta enthalpy is five, it means that I'm not. Now, let me back up. So what is delta enthalpy? Let's ask that question. Delta enthalpy is the total amount of heat that is in the air. Enthalpy takes into account your dry bulb and your wet bulb or your, your air temperature and the amount of humidity that the um, is being removed by that coil. So it takes out of um, it takes out the guessing game of, hey, I've got a 10 degree split across this coil. Why is it so low? I should have 20. Right. Mm -hmm. Throw that little pocket thermometer away. I'm sorry, guys. I carried one for years. I know better now. Get something that measures wet bulb or reads enthalpy directly, whatever. If delta enthalpy is five, I've got a problem. Namely, I'm not removing as much heat as I should be. My process is not working correctly. In air conditioning, we should be at 6.66 .6 roughly is what it works out to for delta enthalpy. Most people do 6.6 .6 or 6.7 right around there. If it's in that neighborhood, you're really close. If it starts deviating from that a bunch, you got problems. So if you have delta enthalpy, I'm not removing enough heat or as much heat as my process should be removing. So now I got to dig further. Okay. What do I start looking for? If the first thing I would probably check is I would go outside. So if my condensing temperature over ambient is too high, I might not be able to reject enough heat. So I'm going to look at my, I'm going to kind of look at my liquid line temperature. Now, we talked about this on the last one where we did, where we were looking at uh, approach temperature. And we talked about approach temperature because approach temperature is the difference between your condensing temperature and, or the, I'm sorry, the air temperature and your liquid line temperature instead of the difference between condensing temperature and liquid line temperature, which of course is subcooling. Um. So I'm going to look at that that liquid line temperature really quick, and I'm going to say, okay, yeah, it's uh, it's a little warm, it's higher than what it should be. It's you know maybe it's 20 degrees over ambient. Eh, sounds like maybe we got a low charge, or maybe the coil's dirty. We need to we need to start looking a little bit further. And then there's that's where that hand on the fan comes in, right? Oh, hey, I got air going straight up perfectly straight up off that fan and this is something where you need to kind of know the equipment you're working on after you get a little experience you you learn this and as a maintenance technician when i would walk up i would feel that fan and and learn the air patterns of different units well when i walk up on that unit now if i'm doing a service i kind of know that air pattern a little bit and I can put my hand on it now and say, okay, yeah, I got a partially blocked coil. I got a really blocked coil or no, that coil feels like it's pretty clean. Okay. So I can probably rule out coil being dirty is my problem. Doesn't visually look dirty. Air feels, feels all right coming off of it. Maybe there's not a lot of heat coming out of it. Okay. We're pointing more towards a charge problem here. That's probably what I'm going to gauge up. That makes sense. Okay, all that makes sense. So it pointed you outside. So if you have uh, an enthalpy change of five, it's, it's, it would also be possible then that you would have an excess of airflow. 
Is that possible? It doesn't really happen out in the wild, is what I've it's told you. Possible. You usually have low airflow, but uh, yeah, it's possible. You might you might have an excess of airflow, and you don't have your dwell time on the coil. Now that again, there you go. That's pretty slim that that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, uh, the only time it, that it I, is that, a possibility, though. The only time I've ever seen that happen is when we had some matchups that would come along, especially right when the sear changed from, I want to say it was to 13 in 2007, maybe, somewhere in there. And we had some strange matchups with air handlers and uh, condensers with air handlers were oversized, and they weren't capable of coming down to the proper airflow. It was really kind of insane. And we had this excess airflow, and then you see the deltas change it, whether you're talking about Delta T or Delta H, it would, it would go downward significantly. Yeah. Uh, but typically in the service world, it's always too low. If yeah. you're okay or too 99 low. 99 times out of a hundred, it's going to be low. Now, again, that's not saying that you can't run across that. You may get some weird matchups once in a while. Mm -hmm. I can see weird matchups like up North, uh, where you need a lot more heating than air conditioning. So you may run a, yeah. uh, you may have to run a furnace with a four ton, blower drive and you only need two tons of air conditioning yeah that, that's an interesting thing it, it's almost like just kind of an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind if you can't quite figure out what's going on because yeah. it, it would be really rare i would think it's a one percent thing like you're saying yeah that's it's, what we like to cover here the one percent stuff well but it's something you like you said you got to keep in the back of your mind and you have to say um mm -hmm. hey, uh it, is this a possibility then you have to know how to check for it and that's where things like the absolute numbers start to come into play more. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, like field piece probes, they're saying field piece probes. All of the, the probes out now, like the wireless stuff, they will do an enthalpy reading? Yeah, as far as I know. Because they, gonna... the, they have the measurements. They have dry bulb and humidity, so they must be able to... I believe field of piece it. testo, um, I think pretty much all of them will direct read enthalpy. Which is really helpful. I, I like probes. Probes are great. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some probes here soon. I'm just yeah. gonna say that I'm ready. They're uh, they're 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 they are the way, in my opinion. Um, I love a lot of the wireless stuff that's coming out. Uh, the integration, even like Field Peace and Testo, of course, have their own apps, and they are pretty nice. I've used used a couple of them, played around mm -hmm. with a couple of them. I haven't used them on a service truck. I'm sorry, guys. They were. They came around after I got out they of the truck. What, so. what year? What year was it that you left the field? By and uh, large, I'll say. Now you're gonna make me think. Oh my gosh! Let's see how many. It was a couple decades back. 2016. Uh, I was driving a Ford Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> 2016 was like right when the craze started. With a, with a four yeah. on the floor. And there was a four on the floor. Four barrel carburetor. Yep. Yep. Ozzy track rear end. Oh. Never mind. Sorry. Well, it really is the '60s. All of a sudden, look at that. I was driving my Mustang. I had a 289 in it. And I wanted the 429, but Mom was mad, so I got the 289. Or what? The four cylinder. What's the point? You know, dude, that's a must. You're talking Mustang two now. Don't even go there. Mustang two. What a what an awful pinto bodied piece of junk that was. Man, that was. <laughs> oh yeah. Man. Every time oh, I hear gosh. that name. Oh, you know, it was built on the Pinto body platform. I know. It's, Pinto was a bad that, idea. That tell you all, all about it. Just like. Everything you need to know. What's the best muscle call of all time? Pinto? No one's ever said it. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Sorry about that, guys. I love Mustangs. I like the history. I read about them a lot. So whenever I know something, I like to say it right away to appear, appear intelligent because you never know when it's going to come around again. What if the enthalpy's nine? That's kind of high. What the pit enthalpy's eight? Um, I'm going to immediately start looking for low airflow. And is that the only cause for the excess? Realistically, yeah. Yeah, I can't think of anything. There's got to be got, some kind of weird or, thing. Or you have your probe in the wrong place. Oh yeah, you got it like sticking right in the middle of the A coil or something. Yeah. You you need to get your probes out of line of sight of the coil. Because when you're measuring the dry bulb temperature, radiant heat is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Radiant cooling is a thing, too. So uh, how, how much of a significance does it play? Are you talking about like you could have like 
couple let's, let's talk enthalpy could you have like a degree or two of enthalpy coming to play because you're in line of side of the coil you might depends on how big. Sensor, depends on how your sensors oriented how about if if you're measuring a three ton uh, capacity and, and just for the record enthalpy is not in degrees well, you know, I use degrees because I'm ignorant. What what is what is the proper term? BTUs per pound. BTUs that it, yeah, I actually knew that already. I should have said it. Okay. Because it comes down to to measuring how many BTUs per pound of air you're moving. Pounds of air. That sounds interesting. We've covered that on the show a couple of times. That's always like a a head buster. We talk about different elevations and different pound amounts of like air and airway. Specific volume of. Whatever. We can't take it today. Though. We're doing charging for service techs, and service techs don't have to say the word specific volume ever. I don't think. I don't think they do. They should. Maybe they, maybe they should. Maybe Should, should <laughs> techs know more about this sort of thing? Like the, like the scientific, I uh, say scientific, but the, like, know the numbers behind what they're doing? In my opinion, yes. It's a great idea um, because it, it helped me to develop a better process when I walked up to a unit because I understood once I understood what things were happening, I could look at this and say, okay, well, A affects B, C, and D. So if I just look at A here, it kind of gives me an idea of what's happening down the stream or D is affected by A, B, and C. So if I measure D kind of gives me an idea whether or not A, B, and C is doing what it's supposed to do. And then I can backtrack if I need to. If D is messed up, I, I can start backtracking and making other checks based on what I know from experience are common failures. All right. Since since you do have the experience, everyone – well, okay, let me, let me put it this way. Let's say 10 or 15 years ago, you would say – Super, you got to be doing that superheat and subcooling. I heard that so many times. It's like at nauseum, superheat and subcooling. Oh, it's beat into me the first week on the uh, job. Oh, yeah. That's the upper echelon right there. If you're not doing superheat and subcooling, it's like there was no time before that. That was just the dark ages or something like that. Since then, is that the most important number? When you're no. charging, is that the number? What What is the most well, important okay, number? Okay, when I'm, when I'm actually doing the charging, yes. Yeah, the airflow is done. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, because you can't have the proper superheat and subcooling numbers until you have your airflow correct. Right. Yeah, you you're just charging for a. You, you're it, charging to the low airflow. Right, because the, the high airflow doesn't really exist. So yeah, you're charging well, to the low. I mean, airflow. You might be charging to high airflow, but again, that's a, um, that is a rarity, at least in my world. And yeah, I'm pretty sure in most of the HVAC world, high airflow is a rarity. Low airflow is actually the norm and proper airflow is happens only slightly more than uh, high airflow. <laughs> Boy, that's a bleak outlook right there. Uh, I don't know. Acceptable airflow. I mean, when you really think about it, because there's some variability to that whole thing, right? I mean, some people, you know, like you have different systems that are lower than 400. They're like, hey, yeah, 350. you might have some that are running around 350. And that's going to be, um, man, I used to have all this mm -hmm. minute mm -hmm. memory. And that's what we were right, expecting I, here. Today. I have slept since then and maybe had a beer. Been drinking. It's a good Possible. excuse. Not tonight. Been, but, drinking but heavily. Tonight. Between when I did all this, like calculated all this stuff normally now. Oh, yeah. Maybe a couple dead brain cells. And we, we talked about on the show, I don't know if me and you talked about it or not, but it's come up about 100 times probably, that you know a lot of these machines will run on lower airflow uh, for comfort purposes because they won't dehumidify as well because the evaporators are oversized. So you'll see them run at 350 a ton instead of 400 because the I guess the saturation point in the coils too high to do a good job of dehumidification. Well, yeah, because one of the things is they happen um, in order to reduce the compression ratio, they've bumped up on higher, especially mm -hmm. on higher efficiency units, we've bumped up that saturation temperature by about five degrees from 30 to a, from evaporator TD, right? Is the mm -hmm. amount the evaporator is below 
you are entering air temperature. Um, and they've kind of bumped that up to around 30 from 35. So what that does is, again, they, they narrow that distance between the um, um, high pressure and low pressure to reduce compression ratio, to reduce electrical usage, to make things more efficient. I always thought that was a neat trick. It's, it's a it's trick. A, it's an awesome trick. And then you have to lower it right back down so you can be comfortable. Possibly. but Yeah, right. Not all but, the time, but sometimes. So there, there's multiple things going on to this when you're talking about humidity removal. One, air conditioning systems are not designed to be the primary humidity removal device in a house because air conditioning systems are not triggered on humidity. They are triggered on temperature. They are a temperature changing device. They're only designed to lower the dry bulb temperature. It just so happens that they also do remove some humidity. Mm -hmm. So if you have a grossly oversized unit, you're going to have crap for humidity removal. Sorry. Right. The way it is, because it's not going to run long enough. It can't remove humidity unless it's not running and it doesn't get turned on by a humidistat it gets turned on by mm -hmm. a dry bulb thermometer or a, a dry bulb thermo, you know, thermostat. So humidity removal on a standard cooling system is a bit of a bonus. You want better humidity removal? Put in a dehumidifier if you've got humidity problems. But you don't see a whole lot of houses with dehumidifiers, so the AC must cut it most of the time. Or people just don't know the difference. Or they just, yeah, they've become accustomed to 61% relative humidity inside or, or whatever. Well, okay, I'm a tech out there. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to lower the airflow down to 325. Well, Good or bad? What What's going to happen? Saturation so, temperature is going to go down. Saturation temperature is going to start dropping, right? You know, the, there's a there's kind of a trade off point in there because you're not bringing as much air into that, which means you're not going to do as much sensible cooling because you're not having the volume of air. But the air you're coming across, your saturation temperature is going to go down. You may start removing more humidity. I'm shooting for 33 degrees of saturation temperature. Hmm. Maximum <laughs> maximum humidity removal <laughs> without well, freezing constantly. Thinking about that. Getting chill <laughs> thinking about that. Okay, so okay, let's say I let's say I do that. Let's say I change it to 325 a ton and my saturation goes down a few more degrees. My pressure is going to go down a few more degrees and then my compression is going to go up. Your compression right? ratio is going to go up. You're going to use more energy to do the same thing and you might get a little bit more humidity removal. You're going to get a little bit longer run time because it's not going to be um, cooling the space down quite as quick. But honestly, if it's an oversized system, you're still going to have humidity problems in there because it's not going to, it's just not going to run long enough. There's only so much lipstick you can put on a pig. Right. That's what I'm thinking. You, you can adjust it, but the realm of adjustment doesn't extend into comfort. It's just different levels of discomfort. You know, there's still too much humidity, I would yeah. think, a lot of the time. And what can you do at 325 a ton? You can't go too low. I mean, you're going to freeze up periodically or something. You know, and, and my my take on all this is after my years in the field of being a, a technician, looking at a lot of different things is we got to we got to step back and look away from the equipment sometimes because, hey, where's that humidity coming from? That's true. The holistic view that we've been we getting can, here lately. We can take it. We as HVAC technicians can try to take humidity out of the house, but maybe we need to step back and ask the question, where's the humidity coming from? Can we stop humidity from coming in? If we get rid of the humidity coming in, maybe we don't need a dehumidifier. Maybe that system will do just fine. That's been like the common thread here, especially this year is, is, the guest, at least on this show, I think in general, has been more awareness to like the entire house as as it relates to the HVAC and just comfort in general. It, it, and that's where the HVAC industry should have gone because we we brand ourselves as comfort specialists, but yet all we want to do is throw some equipment in here. And I know we're getting off way off the topic again of charging. Right, we're talking. We're about still in HVAC, so we're we're, we're there. talking about different kinds of charging now. But you know, 
there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that um we can look at now again it's more knowledge and I, i'm i'm gonna apologize now we may have to go learn something new well no one knew about this <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to warn everybody all right go uh, ahead. The, in the since I've gotten in the industry, this this industry is just ridiculously amazing at the um, advances that it's made in the 17, 18 years that I've been in the industry now. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. The advancements that it's made, given, given the age of the industry. But if I look around the rest of the world is advancing at the same rate and it is hard to keep up with all this stuff. This is true. I answered a phone call with my watch yesterday. I'm like a spy. Well, you just think about how old the smartphone is. Good question. When was the first smartphone? 2002, 34, five, when was it? E9, <laughs> 2009. Was when was that? Oh wow! When the okay. iPhone first came out. Yeah, wow. And now what are we on? Like three hundred or something? They come up with a couple new ones every day, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many they've made, but it, when you look at it in a time frame and the amount of evolution that it's gone through, you know, in and I, again, I'm going to play my age here. My first computer that would connect outside of my house. I had to lay a telephone receiver on a modem, okay? And and most of you don't even know what a modem is probably because they made funny noises. And I actually had to dial the phone number into a local Radio Shack store to get on a bulletin board service. I had to dial the phone number with an analog rotary dial phone and then lay the receiver on top of the modem. I feel like you're making this up. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> uh, I, I did. I did write Commodore sixty four for your first computer. Ooh. I don't know if that was maybe too too early. First, okay, so first computer, um, Atari ST five twenty ST. Atari. Yeah. You're playing pole position with that thing or something? No, no. Atari made computers. <laughs> I didn't even know that. That's yeah, interesting. They actually had a mouse on them. They were the Atari was the ones that came up with the mouse and actually the whole like Windows and icons type thing. At that point in time, PC was still running on on uh, DOS. Good grief! I don't know any of this. Stuff. I had a mouse in the eighties, and the then 80s, we, I didn't have a computer at all until like we didn't have one at our house at all. We had Windows ninety five was the first thing we had. Yeah, and then um, later on to get on the to get on the bulletin board, I had a Radio Shack TRS eighty, which. I mean, it had, I actually, kind that was kind of a, a retrograde, but, or a downgrade, but I got it for free. So it would get on and it was kind of like a dumb terminal with two big five and a quarter inch floppy drives in it. I'll be daggone. Eric, aren't you, aren't you 40 something like I am? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I really I think, think we're that far apart in age. <laughs> I don't think we're far apart at all. Uh, I'm trying to imagine. I, I don't think I lived in a rural area. Shocker, I still do. Andy but, uh, 1000 SL2. There you go, Rich. My you speak in his language. Look at us. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. We uh, First computer, we didn't even have anything at our house until like the mid-90s, and it was Windows 95, and we had to sit there, and there wasn't. we didn't have to put the phone on the modem, and I do understand what you're saying. I do remember that, but uh, it dialed up automatically, but we couldn't make phone calls, of course, and stuff like that while we were on the internet. Oh, no, 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 no. Super fast, by the way. It was great. Uh I was on Discord. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> my son has a he games, so I I have hip knowledge in that area. But that's wild. So you had a, you had this stuff early on. So you must you must like having the technology. Of course, you were younger. I mean, you, so your parents had this stuff. Uh, no, <laughs> no. The first computer my brother got given to me, actually got given to my brother and I uh, by my uncle. Uh, when he upgraded his Atari, he upgraded to a newer Atari. And uh, Atari, that's yeah. cool. I had a twenty six hundred myself. It was, it was kind of neat to have it. I look, but I wish I still had it. I don't even know what happened to that computer now. I don't even know where it's at. Because it's one well, of, of course not. Like <laughs> it's been forty years. <laughs> 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 I 
You shouldn't know where it's at. It should be at the bottom of a landfill somewhere. It's a it. Well, I mean, that would be cool just to have sitting around. But I look at the at the speed at which technology has progressed, and HVAC is actually in some ways lagging behind what is possible. Um, I think we've the industry itself has kind of lagged behind. In what area do you think it lags behind? I think they really haven't kept up with what's possible out there within technology. And I think as far as we, the technicians out here, um, the people in the field, we're kind of doing that to ourselves. You know, I mean, we still have people arguing over whether or not digital gauges are worth it. This is true. Uh, in that area, we definitely lag behind. Now, are you talking about maybe, are we, are we talking straight up controls like suited for like in a homeowner sense? Yeah. Like the way well, they interface with it? The way the homeowners interface, what's possible with controlling uh, more things um, within a system, um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities out there that we're missing out. And, and at one point in my career, I was involved with building automation systems in from an HVAC standpoint and doing some programming and, and design on those. So I look at that. Um, you know, I kind of look at it from that aspect of, hey, what's possible? And then I look into the residential world and I'm like, man, some of these things are really, in my opinion, missing out. We are, we're really not doing a very good job of holistically controlling systems, in my opinion. Why, why do you think that has occurred? I think a lot of it is because uh, the industry a has been changing so fast that people can't keep up with it. Um, I think the manufacturers are reluctant to put out new products that they might sell. Um, it might be less than 10% of their total sales or less than 5%. You, you look at some of these manufacturers and their high end systems are probably less than 5% of their total sales. Um, so the, they are, and they look at where they're spending the do, the uh, development dollars versus what they're getting back um, from those for those development dollars. And I think um, a good part of it is that a lot of us in the field are very reluctant to embrace some of the newer technology. You know, okay, check this out and see what you think of this. All right, it, I think it's like a trickle down thing. Who 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 goes into HVAC? Who gets steered into HVAC? It, it's like a trades position. So the person that's a classical tradesman wouldn't be the guy that you know that does the stuff you're talking about. You well, know, we well, picture he, a guy sitting on a beam with his lunch. You know what I'm saying? It, uh, there's a stereotype that I think persists, whereas the trade could be presented as something other than what it's being presented as now to reel in people who have interest in this area and there that interest will grow. hundred percent. I a hundred percent agree with that. And um, I, I'm going to throw out a plug for my wife, Rachel, who did a uh, no. uh, okay, presentation go ahead. down at uh, Brian Orr's symposium last year uh, or for Brian Orr's symposium. We did our presentations remote because of COVID, but she is a chemist by trade. She has a master's in chemistry and, and all kinds of other big fancy degrees with more things that I don't understand than history and all kinds of stuff. But regardless, she did a whole presentation on why HVAC should not be considered a trade, but should actually be considered a science. I, you know, I saw part of this presentation and I was and my thought was, is this Kaiser's wife? What yes. is she doing here? <laughs> but then as I realized, like, well, she is. Because I remember you told me she was a chemist because she was making fun of the, uh, our, our vacuums really weren't that impressive. <laughs> yeah. I remember this. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was interesting. So, okay, so it could be presented in a whole new way. Therefore, I guess the idea would be then, uh, therefore, a new section of the populace would enter the trade and then it would naturally change because they would become dominant in the trade later on. It should be those people that we're inviting into the trade, in my opinion, because if we look at this trade, I mean, just what we were talking about here tonight, we're talking about chemistry, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about air. We're talking about airflow. Those are fluid dynamics, which is part of physics. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're talking about math and calculating uh, different things. So we get into some math there. Um, we've got technology involved. You know, there's all these all kinds of different thermostats that connect into networks and Wi-Fi and all kinds of different things that are happening now. We've got communicating thermostats. Well, guess what? That's not electrical. That's electronics. And we're also talking yeah. about communications technicians. We're we're looking at so many different facets. And we HVAC has always, I hate to call it this, but kind of been a redheaded stepchild in the trades because it literally touches every other trade out there in some small aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've met HVAC technicians that have a much better understanding of electrical work than the electricians. 100%. We have to. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just think about like the guys who wire the house, uh, how simple the wiring is for a house. You mm -hmm. know? And then you think about the controls that we use, and I don't understand all of them, but I, you know, I have a limited understanding, and I know that they can get very complicated, the low-voltage controls that we use. And I compare, and it's like, well, we, we are. We're we're electricians. We have that and the airflow. Well, we're supposed to master a lot of stuff. Not necessarily it happens, but we're supposed to. We should we should be masters of fluid dynamics, right? Because mm -hmm. air is actually a fluid. We should be masters of, you know, we have to know carpentry. We have to know plumbing. We have to know electrical. We have to know electronics. We have to know chemistry. Um, there, There's a lot of different things that we mess with um, that are related to chemistry. She honestly told me, she says, you guys in the field probably use more science than a standard bench chemist sitting in a lab doing basically do what work where they just move things from one place to another. And, you know, we, we use more of that out here. Now we also have to use our hands. We have to be physically safe around us. Um, it really is a scientific trade. You know, we could just look to our friend John Pastorello. He was a chemist, and now he went to the trade because he said it was, you know, he made more money and everything. Yeah. Uh, Weaver, that's true. There are some electricians out there. My, I was pitching an electrician that was the guy that was pulling the Romex on a new construction residential job and just sticking it into the outlet box, and that was that was the guy I was pitching. Yeah, I mean— it, Not there, a fair comparison. A, there is a lot of different grades of people and, and whatnot in the trades. I mean— yeah, um, you know, and it, I can go on in sheet me in in HVAC. We got sheet metal. We've got insulation. We've got hazardous materials. the The list goes on. We weld. Um, we solder. You know how much how much farther do you want to go? You I'm know? trying to figure out how much stuff we do. I thought you were going to list all of it. It's like we I do a down, lot. I sat down one day to try to make a list, and and that list got so long. I was like, oh, I don't even want to finish this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest with you. When I think about trades, uh, we we create, we build, we fix things. It seems like a much more, I don't want to use the word like noble, but when you compare it with other things, you know, we should be at the top. You know, we, we, we create comfort. We, we fix things where we have a use that goes into our own private lives. We can fix things at our home. I, I, anything in the house that breaks that I don't feel like calling the warranty company about, I fix it myself. It's a new house. That's why I say that, but. Well, and I mean, unfortunately, we we kind of get a bad reputation because there are a lot of people in this trade that have been pushed into it that unfortunately um, really don't know enough about what they're doing. And yeah. I don't I don't like to say that, but we as a trade need to do better. I, I think so too. I, I think so, and I, just because someone enters a trade and they might be in a position where they're not a benefit to the trade. doesn't mean that they'll stay that way either. Right. So we can educate people and show them why it's so cool to do this stuff. And I think that'll work a lot of times because what we just talked about was really interesting to me, yeah. but I'm a nerd. So. And, well, and the thing is that I think a lot of people forget that you don't know what you don't know. That's a true statement right there. It can't be it, untrue. It, it takes a... <laughs> It takes a minute to wrap your head around it. The first time I thought about that, I'm like, <laughs> what? What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're not philosophers. <laughs> we're we're tradesmen. And it should be. I, I saw in the chat, uh, Thomas, which is T-Leg, said we need to bring it back to high school level entry. I, I think that is exactly right. Why, why is it not in every high school? Because we got kids training for 
again, you know, not all of them, but like useless occupations, useless, bodiless, empty occupations where we could do something for real tangible things that are worth something. You'll never be out of a job, buddy. That, that's exactly right. Any any trade, I think you'll need. A plumber, a plumber's I, always got a job, especially he's good at it. I mean, this is good at it, you know, we're talking about, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I was talking with a um, the owner of a, actually, yesterday, talking with the owner of a local supply house. Um, they're a, still a family-owned supply house here locally. And uh, they do a lot of refrigeration. And she was telling me that they, they're they seeing, it, it, you know, if we think we're in trouble in HVAC, they're seeing even fewer newer people go into refrigeration. Well, that's true. There's a whole flip side to this in there. That's, that's yeah. true. And refrigeration in you know, we can we can kind of live without air conditioning. Most people can, but not a lot of us are going to survive if our refrigeration world goes no. down. No, I mean, if my because Fiesta taco cheese doesn't stay cold, I can't have taco Tuesday. You can't have your quesadillas. That, oh, yeah, queso dillo. Queso <laughs> dillo's. Yeah, queso dillo's. And I just want to say real quick that uh, Billy says if we teach everybody how to do it right, he'd be out of a job. He's, he's a tech guy, John Stone. Billy, you'll mine. never be out of a job, dude. <laughs> no, we'll we'll have a, fle- a, a fresh flow of people into the trade. It just can't be helped. It's inevitable that we'll need your help. Absolutely. It, it, it's just it's it's perpetual because there's always the same dynamic and I don't know human nature. You're always going to have a percentage of people that are going to be the guys that are going to have to call Billy. It's going <laughs> to have to happen. Everybody will, even the smart guys. You know, there's a, you can't know it all. Like you said, you can't know it there, all. There, I, I see the. I mean, I I really I know we've we've gone way off topic here, but hey, what the heck? We're, what was that topic? Charging. Yeah. How how far we're only like, I don't know, half an hour over time now or something. Oh yeah, this show will end soon. I just want to warn everybody, but you know, and, and by soon he means maybe before midnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens. Basically, I don't know when it's going to end. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eastern time. <laughs> oh man, it's like I had a question for you, but it's not like you were about to say something. No, no, shoot. I mean, I've, I've just been rambling over here. No, I think we were talking about trades. I feel like we oh. should sit here and talk and, like, tell everybody we're going to ramble randomly yeah. for two hours. And... Well, they, they've watched the show before. They know what happens here. Uh, if, <laughs> if there, Yeah, if there are any questions that anybody wants to ask, just go ahead and ask it. I will be wrapping it up soon. Despite the, the promise of going till midnight, it, it will end soon. It's about 1030. So. I said before midnight. Before, and that will be true. That will absolutely be true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not in charge of this, guys. I, folks, I, I just, I'm throwing out ideas here. Yeah, I, 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 I'm courteous to the guest. If they want to continue talking, I, I'll give them, you know, a while. And then I'll be like, hey, I got to go to bed. <laughs> I will, I will, I'll sit here and ramble until my wife comes and tells me I got to go to bed. Or you hear the, the, the crash of her yeah, staying. I'm yeah. pretty sure she's done with that now. I, I would hope so. I think it's been a long enough time she could have stained the whole, you know, whatever, all the stuff in your house. Uh, yeah, so if there's any questions out there, charging or you know, or whatever, you know, basically ask those questions. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, you said you've been in a trade for 18 years. We've been talking about how this is such a great trade. Why did you come into this trade? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, so I actually got into this trade. My ex-father-in-law owned a company. And at the time I was dating with his, dating his daughter and she and I were living together. And... Um, I was traveling and working for a commercial tower company. And mm. yeah, so I climbed communications towers and um no, I couldn't do that. That kind no. of stuff. Okay. Uh worked worked all over the Midwest. We were based out of St. Charles, Missouri. And uh I worked all over the Midwest, up into Wisconsin and Minnesota and down in Tennessee and all kinds of neat stuff. So um and really wanted to get off the road because we traveled typically like it was a our typical schedule on the road was Monday through the following week, Friday. And then we were home. We would come home on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and go back on the road the next Monday. Mm. So it was, it was pretty grueling life. <laughs> it was, a, that sounds even more grueling than HVAC. Yeah. And you know, if you think, uh, think spending a, a, a couple hours on a roof working on a rooftop unit is is hot or cold try 400 feet in the air in the middle of summer or the middle of winter no 
I will not try it. <laughs> That's never going to happen. I've seen videos I, of guys standing on those things. No. I'm just going to say I've spent most of the night 200 feet in the air about a mile from Lake Michigan in Wisconsin in January. Yeah, well, I can see why you wanted a different job. <laughs> so I'm sure you jumped on that. Uh, okay, so you got the HVAC I, job. I kind of knew. I kind of knew the electrical. Like I, I grew up around. Of course, my dad was into electrical and electronics and plumbing and all kinds of things mechanical. Um, so I pretty well had a good handle on that side of the trade. And he invited me to come work for him. Said, "Hey, I need a service tech." Um, and he sent me to a couple focused schools. Um, Linux at the time, Linux learning solutions or something like that, HVAC mm -hmm. learning solutions, maybe. So he, he sent me into a couple of those and, and, uh, I became his service tech. He had a little small company in Southern Illinois and, uh, That's um, interesting. I spent, uh, um, what, six, seven years with him and then got married, got divorced, and then ended up um, meeting my, or well, started dating my current wife and moved from Illinois to Indiana, uh, which is where she lived at. And fell in love with the trade, got involved with RSES, um, jumped on a bunch of the uh, forums that were online. Oh, yeah. HPAZ uh, Talk. HVAC talk, HVAC pro tech, uh, pro tech. Gosh, there was a bunch of them. Some of them don't even exist anymore. And, um, Oh, that's true. I, I, wonder. I just, I fell in love with the trade. I've moved around, um, residential. I, I, I kind of went backwards from what it seems like a lot of people do. Um, uh, when I moved to Indianapolis, I took a job as a, as a residential change out installer because there's a company over here that needed that. They come me up and they're like, well, you know, we, we need this. It, for me, it was kind of fun because I got to see a different side of the trade. I got to learn some new things and some new skills and work with sheet metal a little bit that I really not had a chance to focus on being a, a regular service tech in the field every day. How long did it take of being installed to realize it was much worse than service? Um, I <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I would think, yeah. I, I got to say, I really don't think it was any worse. I don't um, understand. I see a lot, of, a lot of people... I had to work, I think, just as hard being a service tech as I did being an installer. It was just different for me. Um, now, mind you, when I am installing things, I'm that perfectionist. And the guy that I – so my ex-father-in-law's company, there was me as a service tech. There was one other guy that did the installation, and then my father-in-law owned the business. He did the sales and would help out as a tech or – help out on installations wherever needed. And then he had a, a dispatcher in the office to, to answer the phones and kind of keep that stuff up. And occasionally if there wasn't service, I would go work with the install guy doing change outs or, you know, we would do high end residential or we would not work for builders. We would only work for a homeowner mm. if they wanted um, a system put in because he didn't like to do it. He didn't like to do things half-assed let's put it that way um, that's a good thing yeah he wanted to do a really good job i learned a lot about it from him um and you know i still use things he's taught me and, and that i learned there to this day uh so, the guy that he had on install was a whiz at metal and i'll oh, okay yeah when i when, when i uh when i got his name the guy's name was jim and, and uh, uh when i got into installation i i would kind of stand there and go look at that and I go what would Jim do in this case what would he do and I'm like okay well I don't know what he would do exactly but this <laughs> is what I think he's gonna do so that's what I'm gonna do let's get this because, duck board over here we'll use duck board that's what he would uh, say yeah no, no probably not we're we're up here in sheet metal land buddy oh, we, oh we it's not have, Florida I got you we do have some duck board in the area um but it, it made me learn a lot more about and, and I I was really able and I really focused on like when I'm doing installations because I'd been a service tech and I'm looking at this like, Hey, I might have to come back and maintain this because when I was not, I was a lead installer, but I wasn't the lead team. They had a, a lead team and the guy that led that team would typically not do 
hardly any service at all. Like he might go do some maintenance once in a while mm -hmm. if or if installation was slow. But if there wasn't enough uh, installation work, they would roll me into service. So I kept all my service tools in my truck as well because I never knew what I was going to do. Uh, I was kind of a jack of all trades that was primarily focused on residential replacement, but I'd roll into service, I'd roll into maintenance, whatever they needed me to do. And I was never slow. Like there was times when it would slow down and they're going, Hey, we got work for you. I'm like, no, really? I'll go home early today, guys. I'll, you know, I'll take a 30 hour week. Nah, <laughs> no, no, nah, just move. We got, work. we got work to do. Come on. Nah, that's a good I transitioned that's a good into thing. commercial and industrial work. Um, you know, where I got to work in on a lot more rooftops, get into some factories, production line stuff, chillers, bigger boilers, um, you know, some, some different refrigeration, small refrigeration units. I tried to, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about refrigeration. I know the theories behind a lot of it, but I've never really done a lot of it. It's like I read a book on it. Yeah, kind of. Oh. That's, a, that's not uncommon either. So, so why leave the field and uh, go be the glorious consultant? Is that the proper word, consultant? That you Well, were? initially when I left the field, um, I got an offer to go work for a distributor as tech support rep. Um, so I did that for a few years, and I really – I liked it, but I really wanted to do a lot more training. So I got an offer to support a rep agency as a trainer um, and focused a lot more on training. Uh, and then that ended when COVID hit. So um, I do uh, now, of course, I consult and do custom training for places. You know, if somebody wants a training program, I'll, if I don't have one already, I'll develop a training program and, and train people. You work with some of our buddies. I'm, not, I'm trying to remember. It was you, right? Do you work with Objut from time to time? Once in a while, yeah. I've done some work with him. And David Richardson? I've never actually worked with David. I know him. I've uh, okay, taken maybe that's some of the NCI was. classes. Um, fantastic. Man, that's a fantastic trainer right there. I should get him uh, back on soon. I can only he's hope good. to be as good as he is. He, he, he's so good. And he's so relatable to people the way he he does things it's always like it's underpowered like it's not coming in to an intellectual sounding even though it is he's very good at that it's yeah, like his thing phenomenal i i hope that i'm as good as him someday i when want to I, be as good as david as well when so, i grow up and and figure out what it is i want to do I'm one day you know david's 40 something as well so we're all in the same group so we should already be there if it was going to happen the bad <laughs> news it's not going to happen david's going to be superior for the rest of his life you are probably <laughs> right about that. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I love having the, the guests that I have on this show. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a good time. Uh, we talked about charging 21% of the time tonight. That's not science. That's just for comedy purposes. Uh, we have we had a couple questions. 76.5% uh, of all statistics are made up on the spot. Absolutely. Uh, you know, what was the Anchorman one? Uh, Sixty percent of the times it works every time with the uh, the, the Sex Panther <laughs> cologne that he had. Oh my gosh, it's hilarious! Uh, we have a question. It's going to be a question that requires a, a fair amount of talk because I don't well know. We can, we can hit it. Maybe hit it next time that we do this. Um, we're talking about. I haven't hit, got the cane off the stage yet here, so you know. Okay. Well, we have uh, Hittite King. Well, we would only answer this for Hittites and not Amorites or Canaanites. Sorry, that's stupid. Okay, house normal condition is around 58 to 59 degrees wet bulb and say 80 uh, Fahrenheit outside dry bulb, runs around 5 superheat and not very low for the compressor. He was asking about piston operation in general, and I think the implication of what he was asking was the superheat's always the same, which is variable. 58 uh, to 59 wet bulb is rather warm in a house. So, oh, I'm sorry, 58 to 59. Wait a minute. Wet bulb. He's saying wet bulb. Sorry. I'm thinking dew point. Dew point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because there's these, there's like four or five terms here. We have wet bulb, dew point. Uh, some of them get... No, no, he's at dry bulb. Five degrees superheat. So, house normal comfort conditions around 58, 59 wet bulb. Um, I wish I knew a dry bulb temperature to go with that. 
let's uh, let's say uh, this. Uh, but let's do, five, uh, five, I mean, five degrees superheat. Yeah, what kind of that. unit is it? Did, did he say that anywhere? Uh, um, let's see. The previous uh, he had something else he wrote. It says question: Can we say piston systems normal operating indoor wet bulb fifty eight to fifty nine? Okay, let's say what are design conditions for HVAC units generally where they fall. Well, <laughs> Okay, so what are design conditions, or what are they rated at? Uh, what are they rated at? 95, 80, 67. 95, 80, indoor dry bulb, 67. Not, no, 90, so 95, outdoor dry bulb. Right. 80 degree indoor dry bulb, mm -hmm. 67 degree wet indoor wet bulb. So 67 degrees, and that ends up at what, like 50-some relative humidity? Um, that is That should be 80 degrees at 50% relative, if I recall my numbers correctly. So, like, if we put in here, I'll just punch it in here. 80 and... He does use it, everybody. Seven, right? So, that is a... Here, here you can you can see... I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, not yet, no. No, nope. it, it's not going to show up. It, well, you have to trust me. Anyway, that is 50 point seven three eight eight nine two two four nine one seven five eight percent relative humidity so if it's dry inside rel relatively dry for comfort conditions it's not 70 percent humidity inside if it's dry inside and it's warm outside you're going to have a pretty low superheat on a piston you could yeah so so it, but here but that's so natural that happens that, a lot during the summer though that that eighty sixty seven indoors mm -hmm. is warm for human comfort when I talk about human comfort, I am going to switch my thinking to dew point. Okay. Okay. Because dew point has to do with how we perspire. Now, humans perspire 24-7 all day long. All right. So we need to get that dew point lower in order to make it comfortable inside for humans. We want to be under, ideally under a 55 degree dew point, somewhere between 50 and 55 is ideal human comfort range. So that dew point for that 8067 is at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be warm in there at that point. Now, if I switch that to say 55, five and an 80 degree indoor dry bulb i need my humidity to be down about 42 percent or my wet bulb to be at about 64. it's still going to be a low superheat okay let's define low uh yeah. what's the compressor want typically 20 degrees superheat well, if you run a piston system, you always want to have five, a minimum of five degrees super heat. You don't want any right. liquid going back. Now, I'm going to put a caveat on that, okay? And and uh, Joseph pointed out here, um, like a Mitsubishi Mini Split, if you measure superheat on that, you're going to see zero to five degrees. But why can they run a zero to five degree superheat on this? Okay, here's my guess. Uh, well, all their compressors have accumulators. Right. On them. So the accumulator catches any liquid that may come back before it goes into the to the compressor. So an accumulator, right, is a shell. The vapor line coming into it drops down into the bottom, and then the true suction line for the compressor sucks off the top. Mm hmm Right, it, it gets the vapor off the top to make sure. Wait a minute, no, I'm thinking about that wrong. Drops in, drops in, and then there's a U tube in there that is the true suction line so that it can suck oil out of the bottom of it. If the oil gets up to the bottom of that U tube because there's a port in it, I'm thinking about it backwards. Yeah, it's like an orifice. This yeah, there's an orifice in the bottom at the side of the U bend, and then that U bend goes up and sucks the pure vapor off the top of that accumulator right. and the point of that is to make sure that the compressor is only getting um 
the vapor back to it. Now, there's a couple benefits to doing that. One, we don't have to worry nearly as much because they run electronic expansion valves typically on those. And sometimes that electronic valve, depending on what happens when the compressor changes speed, sometimes that valve lags a little bit. And then um, you can get a, a slug of liquid coming back. Okay, so that compresses the compressor because, of course, like I said, we can't compress the liquid um, in the compressor, damages the compressor. More than compression, washes the bearings out of that compressor. So we don't want to get that liquid coming back into the compressor. We've got to keep it out. The other thing it does, if you think about it, is it keeps a, almost 100% of that coil, that indoor coil, at the same temperature. Because if we're adding superheat, mm -hmm. the last little bit of that coil is starting to rise in temperature as it's coming out of the end of that coil. Uh, where's the superheat measured at in that zero to five? At the evaporator or at the compressor? At the well, not at the compressor. It's at the vapor line entering the outdoor unit when it's That's in like that. I should have said it like that. That's what I mean. At the, at the service valves. Yeah. yeah, at the service valves. Well, service valve on a mini split because most of them only have. Uh, technically, they have two valves, but they typically only have a uh, a vapor line access port. Well, if we're if we're looking at zero to five measured at the valve, it, it would be reasonable to say that there's probably very little, if any, coming out of the evaporator. It might have picked up a couple of degrees on the way back. Well, yeah. it's right on the other side of the wall sometimes, yeah. but you know what I mean? It could be. Typically, coming out of the evaporator on a mini split, short line set, you're not going to have much. So every piston system that I've seen includes an accumulator in residential, unless I'm forgetting one. Because sometimes I'll see the ones with the TXV, they won't have the accumulator on the a residential. Accumulator on a resident. Are you talking about mini splits or are we talking about regular? I'm talking about regular systems. Most of them have an accumulator in some way, on, shape, or on form. A, on a heat pump or a cooling only unit? Oh, it's a heat pump here. It's definitely yeah, no. a heat pump because we have them for pump, the winter too. Heat pumps, you're going to have a lot more accumulators. Mm-hmm. And you may have charge compensators. Periodically, yes. Um, to balance the amount of liquid in the system when you have uh, a disparity in physical size of a coil. And when I'm talking about physical size, I'm like, I'm talking about how much liquid refrigerant can you hold in each coil. And if it's mm -hmm. not similar, we need that charge compensator to hold a little bit of that liquid. Microchannel. Good times. Even with, <laughs> I mean, even with tube and fin. Yeah, well, they uh, they had a few, like I've seen them over the years. Goodman had them for a long time for their heat pumps uh, because of what you're saying. And then uh, there's some now that are tube and fin on one end and micro channel on the other end. So, yes, absolutely. Oh, and it's, oh, by, oh, it's design. You're, you're saying indoors and outdoors. Yes, indoors okay, and outdoors. Right. This I is Zach say. speak where I don't clarify anything. I just sort of mention stuff and you're left to figure out what I'm trying to talk about. I was like, wow, man, it's, it's like they meshed – tube and fin and micro channel in the same <laughs> that sounds like here. something i would do actually uh but no not in this case it was i'm trying to remember some of them were micro channel outside tube and fin inside and some of them were micro channel inside and tube Nordine. and fin outside Nordine, Nordine that's correct. did that about 10 years ago and that was a absolute i'm not even gonna go there <laughs> it just it's uh, you know what i i had a system and this is where there's a disconnect at the supply house with how not not the how to sell something, but knowledge of the product. And I took my I took the word for it that they gave me a replacement coil that was micro channel, where the original coil was tube and fin. And I come back and I say, "Are you sure this is the right coil for this application?" Because I had you know it's a big difference. I said, "No, it's fine." Well, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, it is not fine. Uh, and I, I remember saying, I, I asked some follow-up questions because I was concerned. And it just the pressure disparity because of installing that was not good. Uh, and really, when you're charging um, the um, microchannel outdoor coils, it can be a big challenge because they do <laughs> not have much subcooling, if any measurable subcooling on them, because was... they won't stack liquid back into the coils mm -hmm. well um, uh, that was that one was a heck of a learning system learning 
curve for me. And the, the only way I figured out how to charge those things because their pressure charts were nowhere near where they should have should have been. Um, the only thing that I could figure out to do was I would charge it because they had we used TXVs on them, and I would charge it until I started. I I just barely saw that TXV start to modulate. I'm done. <laughs> Like, that, well, that is interesting to feed the txv i'm out <laughs> uh i the only time everybody has a story about like they did a service call at somebody's house that people would recognize like an actor or something like that usually there's like one or two of those in your career well i actually went to an actor's house not super famous but one of my favorite movies is the replacements the football movie i think it's hilarious. oh that's hilarious that movie's hilarious it's great well the guy the wide receiver who couldn't catch the ball uh i can't remember his name now um I don't remember, but it was his house. So I went, I went there, and I was like, hey, man, I love the replacements, you know, just like an idiot, you know, just like, <laughs> you're great, thanks. You couldn't catch that ball. That was funny. Uh, and he had microchannel Nordine units, and they had been having a fit with them. They were overcharged by, like, three ounces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it went off on high head pressure. I, like, I wouldn't have believed it unless I, I, I took the charge out for it. It was wild. Well, I fought that for a whole summer because they just started feeding us these things, and, you know, I'm an installer and they gave us zero and I mean zero idea how to charge them <laughs> other than here, just charge it to this pressure chart and have fun. And that didn't work out well. Yeah, guys are like, I don't know about this, man. <laughs> we went back on a bad. whole bunch of stuff. And I mean, I put it in, but it was the first time I had ever seen a micro channel refrigerant coil. And we went back, we had to go back on a whole bunch of stuff because... Orlando Jones. There you yes, go. Yes, that is it. That's the guy. Yeah. It's funny. He was out there the whole time. He didn't understand anything that I was saying because we were talking. I was trying to explain to him what was happening. And I should have been taking, speaking of uh, not David Richardson, but David Holt, talking about like soft skills. They were lacking. <laughs> I was sitting there like, yeah, man, this isn't that, this coil doesn't have the same volume. Uh, you know, the it's, it's small. So critically, you know, if you charge it just a little bit over, I mean, you're going to get high. You know, this guy's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, there's nobody <laughs> listening to me right now. But he was well, awful grateful, but uh, it was my funny. Favorite, my favorite character in that movie is the kicker. Oh, Back there, smoke, cigarette, smoking cigarettes in his coat. Oh, it, it's hilarious. Was it Gruff or something like that? Yeah. He, he was hilarious because those lone sharks were after him at the end of the movie. He had to fall yeah. and break his arm or something. Oh, that's yeah. that great. Yeah. If you guys haven't watched that movie, you've really missed Nigel. out. Nigel. Matt, you are on fire here, Joseph. Uh, not, oh, yeah. Oh, it was his last name Gruff, though, right? Come on, Joe. You got everything else here. <laughs> it was a great movie. Sumo wrestler guy. Oh, the whole thing. The the, yeah. the linebackers that shot the guy's car whenever he tipped over uh, the dude's truck. <laughs> oh, my god. Repla- yeah, they tipped over the replacement quarterback's truck or whatever. And- Falco. Yeah. <laughs> With the oh line. We protect the quarterback. <laughs> Oh, well, I don't want to talk about replacements for a long time, guys, because the show will end one day. Uh, There's still 44 people watching us. 44 people watching. Man, they just they just love this movie, too, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> I was, what's a, the guy's name who was the, the, the linebacker that was like a, uh, I don't know if he was like a, a probation officer or like a prison guard or whatever it was, but he's a famous guy. He's the guy who's happy. He plays the character Happy in, like, The Avengers, Iron Man's friend. I cannot remember his name. Oh, I know Joseph knows. Come on, man. Uh, (laughs) If if we get this information, we can can finish this show. But I I literally won't be able to sleep tonight unless I get this guy's name. And I can't believe I can't remember it. Google is your friend. You'll be able to do it when we get done. I know. I will Google if I have to. But I figure I'd be easy and Joseph could do it for me. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Nope. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'll figure it out. Um, anyway, watch that movie, everybody. It's great. Um, <laughs> it's a great mission on a Saturday night. John yeah, Favreau. You, there you go. Yeah. John Favreau. Favreau. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So we learned a lot tonight about various parts of the trade. I'll just say that I'm about to title this thing open talk, which is what podcasters title something when there's no set subject. It'd be like open talk with Eric Kaiser. That's what's charging be. and several other random topics. <laughs> yeah. I used to try to encapsulate it by picking two or three of the top ones, but I'm just going to put open conversation. And I think people understand that, you know, they watched the show before. 
Uh, but we we should end the show because uh, people will age out of the trade, uh, and I don't want people to be able to take the knowledge, not be able to use it because they're old and their bodies have changed since the beginning of the show. Won't be able to function. <laughs> I'm gonna have to age again. <laughs> well, your mustache is gonna be out of control by the time this thing is over. <laughs> It'll be like a, a, a pompous grass growing in the yard or something. So, Eric, I'll, I'll let you uh, have whatever final word you want to have here. And uh, remember, first three rules of charging: airflow, airflow, airflow. That's good. That's good. I think I think our uh, our, our friend David would appreciate that too. I can't stress it enough because anything you do after you, anything you do to bat charging to bad airflow, and it doesn't matter if it's a TXV, right? The TXV's mm -hmm. job is only to control superheat coming out of that evaporator to a point. You have to have the right airflow to charge the system. I think that's perfect advice right there. Cause that's like step number one, right? Because as soon as you increase that indoor airflow, even with a TXV, the TXV is going to open up more. Are going to change your super or your sub cooling because it's going to allow more refrigerant to come back into that indoor coil. That's true. Well, that's a, that's an interesting point there. Oh, we should have made that an hour ago. That was good. <laughs> the sub cooling can they be affected watch, by this. They got to watch the entire show or listen to the entire show just to get that nugget of knowledge. That's the first All time for everything. <laughs> the guys will watch it. Hey, long, how long is this thing? The timestamp says two hours. Is it broke? <laughs> 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 that, that that is a good point though i mean i know uh that i've actually watched it where if the airflow is raised let's say it's 300 cfm per ton goes to 400 cfm per ton it'll open enough that you get several degrees change in subcooling so you've charged it up and hey there wasn't nowhere near enough refrigerant in the system surprise it's yeah. pretty interesting yeah, yeah. i mean it, and it happens a lot and a, i see a lot of people they're like oh you got a txv you don't have to worry about airflow <laughs> well it depends on whether or not you want the system to work on capacity yeah that's right yeah. and the, uh, the suction pressure and saturation still goes down uh when the airflow goes down so mm -hmm. that part changes i mean i don't know is there any reason why txv is superior than a piston with airflow is it just the parameters of it might control things slightly it, better it is going to keep your super heat in a safe range for the compressor over a mm -hmm. wider range of airflow Yep, that makes sense. And for safety purposes. And over a wider range of outdoor conditions. Right. Okay. So, so it, it, keep, it, it keeps the compressor safer, right? And it also keeps the evaporator coil at a pretty steady amount of full on you know, full of refrigerant, full of mixed phase refrigerant. It keeps the percentage of the evaporator coil about okay. the same across varying outdoor conditions. Not the same amount, but the same, same dynamic. Same percentage of the coil is kept at that saturation temperature. Right. I think everybody gets that. I, I get that. Oh, you know what? If I get it, everybody gets it. So that's 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 why I'm the host. Yeah, so I can gauge those things like that in real time. But the right, TXV is really great for protecting compressors. And I know a lot of people, they get a bad rap, um, mostly because the, they're, they're not it, you know, or things are not done properly at installation. That's true. Wait, oh, that's a whole other show right there. <laughs> we can ramble on for two hours about install, bad installation practices and what not to do. That is a good bad installation. Mm. Oh, man. Here we That's go. only like 500 hours long. Yeah. <laughs> Way to encapsulate. Narrow it down, Zach. Nope. No, nope. because we ain't going to end up talking about it anyway. Don't matter. We'll end up talking about which vacuum pump is the best or something. <laughs> something that's forum worthy, you know. Which pump is the best, man? How much is free well, on? The one that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're all free on. The, the one that creates a low enough pressure to do the job. And they, that's the earthy wisdom again. No one wants to hear that. Eric, you want to hear you name the brand and model. And if you're not going to name the brand and model, you come off holier than thou. That's, you got to name the brand and model. It's a very personal thing. <laughs> well, some people may want a fast oil change. Some people might want, um, like, the uh, one of my pumps I bought strictly because it's a dual voltage. And I can change the the voltage on the motor so that I can actually safely run the pump off of a disconnect. 
Which pump did you buy? Uh, it's a JB. The the new yellow jacket does that too. You could there's a there's a switch for two yeah. four, well two thirty or yeah. Some of the and I don't know if anybody's done this yet, but some of the ones that are going to the inverter should be able to do that now. They're going to run in the inverter motors, but realistically it's a switch on the back of there you can make a different plug to plug in a different power cord whatever um but the point is like with vacuum pumps or anything else like that uh when you go throwing that neutral for a 120 volt vacuum pump onto the ground line you're suddenly using that ground wire as a return it ain't yeah. designed for that Oh, so I'll take the condensate pump off that too then. Thank you. Yeah, please. Go buy a 230-volt <laughs> condensate pump. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, but seriously, it, it it has a potential to create problems because you're using the ground wire for something it's not designed for, and you end up with voltage on your ground wire, on your gr the whole ground circuit in the house. This is true. It's a, it's a hot, right? That's, it should be thought of as a hot wire, the neutral. The neutral is a voltage conducting wire. The ground wire is not designed to conduct voltage. It's so you not are better than electricians. Apparently then. I did, you didn't I, agree, Eric. I thought you were going to agree. Don't you like our trade? <laughs> Apparently I paid it our... into AC. Wire. Okay, my dad was an electrician. So if I didn't get that right, I think I would probably a beat with a stick at some point <laughs> yeah that one's uh, I, I, that would be a basic i think that would qualify as basic i think yeah, but it's amazing to me how many people don't understand that in this trade and in other trades yeah that's where you know someone like brian you mentioned brian he's really good at that stuff oh like, he, yeah he's smart very good I, at I, I didn't say that but i mean he's good at that one thing he's really good at he's good at a couple of things he's really good at putting the right voltage in the right places that's true. <laughs> we all should have some aptitude for that, I think. Uh, all right. Well, people are leaving to watch the Olympics now. Uh, so, as according to Joseph, who's giving all those great, all that great knowledge, we've now become less appealing than the Olympics, which aren't even from this year, really. I mean, it's from last year. But it's still but happening this year. It's still happening this year. That Jordan. is correct. Yeah. Well, Eric, I'm going to bed. All right, Zach. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is the segue that I'm using. No, I, I appreciate you coming on. This was a lot of fun. I know it seems like it's all over the place, but hopefully people listen to the whole thing. They get a little bit of what they planned for, a little bit of what they didn't plan for, and I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, sometimes just going all over the place is fun because you never know where it's going to go, right? I mean, I, I love getting on here and talking about this just randomly. That's why I guess come to this show. Because they go to other places, they host webinars. I'm sure a lot of you and your counterparts they host targeted webinars for certain subjects. They go to other podcasts where they have certain subjects. You had to come here to like run around like a kid on the playground. Let's Free talk fall. about capacitors now, okay? Who motors? Ooh, okay. Motors. Yeah, see, East I wrote down stuff about motors while we were talking because East as soon as you said switching back and forth, ECMs like Electric, they do electrically that. commutated motor motors. That's right. So see you soon for that one, Eric. Uh, <laughs> I love talking about ECMs because they're a cool thing. And they're, they are unfortunately greatly misunderstood in this trade in a lot of cases. That's right. That's right. I've had some friends call me that some, some of my friends used to call me and ask me questions about stuff because they were mistakenly thought I had the answer to them. But a lot of it was about ECM motors. And I did know some of the answers. But uh, There you go with motor motors again. Motor motor. That's right. Next next podcast, motor motor. Motor motor. Sorry. All right, Eric, get out of here, man. I'm going to hey. wrap this show up. I'm going to go have some popcorn and watch TV while I fall asleep on the couch. Zach, thanks for having me on tonight, and uh, thanks for all 40-some-odd of you for sticking around for way longer than I think we planned on being here. But, hey, I had a great time, so what the heck. Absolutely. I think everybody had a good time, and I appreciate it, man. Thanks, guys and gals. Have a great evening. Take care, Eric. Talk to you next time. You too. Bye. Thanks, Zach. Our buddy Eric Kaiser right there. Look, we stayed up late tonight, everybody. Look at that. It was a lot of fun. Two hours and 18 minutes. Is that like a record? I, we have we have had a, a couple of them that were two hours plus. So I think it might be a record. I got to check. Not now, though. That would be inappropriate. All right, just the reminders, guys. You can catch us as a podcast coming up in oh, a few days. Next week, right around Wednesday, typically they come out. 
So you'll be able to listen to all the parts you might have missed because with any podcast, you know, usually they're, you know, about an hour longer. This one's two hours. You might have to come back and forth and uh, listen to various pieces over again. The podcast is a great way to do that. We didn't have a whole lot of visual aids tonight because Eric refused to go to his shop. And I can only say that because I know he's still down there and he can hear me. And uh, we learned that Eric has, a, I think it was an Atari computer, which I didn't know existed. Look at this is the stuff we learned on this podcast. It's great. So we had a lot of fun tonight. Like I said, if you like the show, put a like on the stream here. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. You can find us on pretty much any social media. Uh, I try to find whatever my daughter's on and then sign up for that as well. And we're even on some of the stuff that if YouTube crashes, we have to go to, was it Bumble or Rumble or something? We're on Rumble, guys. So if you're on Rumble, check us out. So if Big Tech shuts us down for being controversial, probably won't happen. We'll be on Rumble, too. So, and here, here's something, guys. If you're out there and you want to know, if you if you want to interject your opinion on what we should talk about, I want you to do that. I would like to take the show in that direction where we accept more stuff from the chat as far as what you guys want to talk about. I hope we did that tonight. We'd like to try to do that as much as possible. I think it's a lot of fun, and I don't think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of people plan out and say, we're going to talk about this. This is what we're going to do. And while I think it's good to have, like, a framework, I, I don't mind going all over the place and talking about various stuff because it makes it kind of exciting to me to talk about whatever and have the chat follow along because you guys are the ones that want to learn about something. My job is to bring a guy in and kind of facilitate the conversation. And the guy, like Eric, he does a great job. Uh, David Richardson, we can go on down the line. Jason Objute, a lot of these guys know each other. A lot of them are super smart, and we're also going to have techs on. And I want you to engage the techs. Like next week will be a tech. I think we're going to have Nathan Kenefli. If you don't know who that is, I think that's Bearded HVAC from Instagram. He's a friend of mine. I've actually interviewed him before for a different style podcast that's not HVAC, and he's going to be a lot of fun. And then I know we're going to have some, you know, we can have Jose back, talk about uh, VFDs, variable speed. I want to know what you want to learn about, so help me out. Make sure you put it down in the chat. Make sure you can send me an email. I think I actually have a banner programmed in here. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. HVACshoptalk at gmail.com. I would be happy to make sure you guys have what you want you know, you guys are the people who make the show possible. You watch the show, so please let me know what you want to talk about so I can talk about it. Uh, you can do it in the live chat, or you can do it in advance. I can search people out. If you have a guy you'd like to hear from that maybe I don't know about, let me know. I'll go find him. We'll drag him in here. Uh, one guy I want to drag in here that we are, it's going to be in the future because we already set up a time to go over it is, uh, and I'm trying to remember his last name. You know, I'm not going to say it yet because I can't remember his last last name offhand but he has a youtube channel now he's made a lot of great teaching videos i'm gonna drag him in here it's kind of a, a baiting a way to do that because i can't remember his last name and i'm not gonna say his first name all right so weaver thank you for watching as always hkhvac dragon dylan goodwin thank you hvac residential basics of course big thank you to eric who's in the chat as well uh you see Nightbot at the bottom of the screen there, and if, for those of you who listen or watch, there's a link to sign up for live stream notifications because sometimes YouTube doesn't do it like they should. You can hit the Remind Me when you see the stream beforehand. Like before the stream goes live, you'll see a little Remind Me button on there. So they'll email you. But uh, sign up for that text list because I do that every single time. That's right, T. Like, it is Ty. It is definitely Ty, but I can't remember his net last name was Brenneman. I didn't want to say that, but it's like Brenneman or something like that. He seemed like a really smart guy, a really good guy. And I said, I want to get this guy on the show because I feel like everybody will have a good time talking to him. But I want to know who you guys want to talk to. So let me know. I want to communicate with you. Make sure you, you know, don't hesitate to do that. So we're all here to learn and hang out and have a good time. A little learning, a little entertainment. So make sure you guys do that. HVAC, shop talk at gmail.com. Follow the social media if you want to, if you're on those. And uh, I'm going to get out of here, guys, with our parting words for today. I hope you guys enjoy this. A little bit of a clip. And I'll see you guys on the next one. So I was thinking about something and we have a lot of not just unanswered prayers, but things that happen for a reason that we don't understand and we speculate, but I want to tell you about one of mine. So several years ago, as you guys know, it's been a few years now that I really stopped being in the trade as far as in the field hundred percent. And I went back to splitting time between the podcast, periodically doing calls and all that, but I wasn't in the field like I was uh, for all those years prior. 
Are you gonna Are you gonna input on this? Okay. So uh, we had a medical issue with my wife, and I adapted and overcame, as is my nature, and I try to do. In general, I'm a pretty positive guy, and I try to do whatever it takes, and I've been successful at that with the help of the good Lord and people around me. So, but I think things happen, and there's a reason, and the Lord does steer you and give you the things you need to complete a task. Whenever I became a podcaster, uh, I was no longer in the field, and I could actually participate with things at home. And then we had this lovely little child here who is a light and a great joy. And he, like his brothers, has been diagnosed with autism. And like his brothers before him, he gets a lot of different little therapies and stuff like that. We're driving to speech therapy as, as I do this video. Speech therapy is about 35, 36 miles away from home twice a week. And because of where I'm at in my life and what the Lord has given me and seemingly taken away, but really not taking away, giving instead. Since I'm not in the field, I drive them up here twice a week, typically by myself. Sometimes my wife goes too. We have lunch. It's really nice. But I'm able to do those things. I'm able to do his twice a week uh, therapies for learning how to use imaginative play, which is what we're working on. It's fun. Pretending things or other things, basically. But I've been given this great joy and opportunity, which I see as a joy. I don't see this as a hassle. We have fun with it. We we adapt and overcome. And I think the Lord, He sends us those places. He gives us what we need, always. And I implore you guys to look, look beyond what you think you know about God and Jesus and investigate it for yourself. Because if you're separated from them because you don't like somebody you think personifies them, don't take that as the final definition of, of who Jesus is or who God is. That's not going to be reflected in the human person because every human person has sin. And there's no way around that. There's no way around it. You can't go through your life and not sin at all unless you're Jesus himself. There's only been one person, and that's Jesus, who's gone through his entire life and not sinned. So we're going to sin. So at any time, a Christian may not look very Christian-like. So you can't judge the religion by that. And I don't even like using the word religion, but that's a, that's a tell for a different day. That's a tell for a Men With a Huge podcast. But my point is that God gives us these beautiful things. Look around us. Look everywhere. The trees. Look at every tiny, intricate detail all the way back to the beginning of time. Because no matter what you think happened at the beginning of time, something happened before that as well. And the only, only way it happens before that is if you have something that lives outside of space, time, and any other dimension. That may sound like science fiction to you, but if you really think about it, you'll realize that I'm right about that. Investigate it. Don't wait. You're only given a certain amount of time, and you're given no guarantees. Do do what I did. Read. Read for yourself. Don't take the word of anybody else. Find out for yourself and I think you'll be happy with what you find. That's what I wish for each one of you guys. That's what I have now and it fills my heart with joy. Every day is not perfect. It doesn't matter. Because with God at your side it doesn't matter what your day is like because you're heading somewhere that is perfect.